check out ESPN Films' newly released 30 for 30 podcast. From the producers of our award-winning documentary series, this is an amazing collection of sports stories you need to hear to believe. Speaking of amazing, Delta Airlines and the Fly Delta app make your travel experience amazingly easy with real-time bag tracking, e-boarding, and passport scanning during check-in. And don't forget to download 30 for 30 podcasts to fill your flight with stories that will keep you coming back for more. This is the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. I'm Stephen A. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the latest edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show. Coming at you as I love to do every weekday over the airways of ESPN Radio. That's 98.7 FM New York City. That's 710 ESPN LA. And of course, nationwide over the airways of ESPN Radio, Sirius XM Style, Channel 80. Number to call up as always is 866-729-ESPN. That's 866-729-3776. Lots of stuff to get into today. Whole bunch of stuff to get into today. We've got the Kyrie trade to Boston that might be falling apart. We don't know what's going on. We've got Art Browse. That subject is something that we absolutely positively must tackle on a day like today. And, of course, we have the top story going on in the NFL, and that is of Ezekiel Elliott. Of course, all our hearts and minds are aimed in the direction of Houston, Texas, and its surrounding areas. Due to the flooding that has taken place, few lives lost, um, just catastrophic circumstances. Our hearts and prayers are with everybody in that area, hoping that folks remain safe. And, you know, kudos to the great J.J. Watt for the Houston Texans uh, for donating his time and his money to the cause and, and, and bringing attention even more so. Not that it needs to be because everybody's got their eyes on that right now. And uh, open our wallets, open our hearts, and do what we can. One of the beautiful, beautiful things that I've seen, at least on the television screens, over the last 24 hours or so is that at a time, just days removed from talking about the divide that exists within this country, based off of what transpired in Charlottesville, Virginia, and and beyond, and the protests that were taking place, and wondering where our nation had gone, whether it had lost its moral compass and what have you. It's beautiful to see people extending their hearts and a helping hand to those in need the way that people have been doing to the folks in Houston, Texas, and its surrounding areas do. Uh, You know, the Hurricane Harvey and, you know, the flooding and everything else that has emanated from it all. So, We'll continue to talk about those things and anything that we can do. Let's make sure that we come together and we do it because in the end, we're all Americans. We've got to look out for one another. It's what makes this country great. 866-729-ESPN. That's 866-729-3776. There's an appeal hearing that's being, that's taking place today. Ezekiel Elliott for the Dallas Cowboys reportedly to testify uh, today. In regards to his suspension, for those of you who don't know, he was suspended for six games by the NFL, specifically Commissioner Roger Goodell, in light of um, altercations and allegations of domestic violence against his ex-girlfriend, a lady by the name of Tiffany Thompson. I'm only bringing up her name because it's all over the reports something that we were reluctant to do weeks ago, but she's been in the news, been in the reports. That's her name. Um, she told the all pro, she, she told police that the all pro running back had hit her while they were sitting in a parked car in Columbus, Ohio in July of 2016, according to a 160 page report based off an investigation instigated by the national football league. Um, on July 17th, 19th and 21st of 2016, there were five separate incidences in which Ezekiel Elliott got into an altercation with this young lady. Bruises on her arms, her neck, her back, her wrist, etc. They were all listed in the report and as a result of it, 
He was suspended for six games. Now, a lot of people have different opinions about it because there's an appeal process that's taking place, and I have no problem with the appeal. The appeal is being heard today. The NFL is the judge, jury, executioner, and the appellate courts. You can have a problem with that all you want to. It's their right under the collective bargaining agreement. Get the hell over it. Makes no sense to argue about something, a fact that you can't change. In the case of Ezekiel Elliott, it really, really comes down to the kind of disagreement my man Max Kellerman and I had on first take this morning and even weeks ago. We both agreed that if he's guilty, shut the hell up and go away and accept your penance and be happy it wasn't worse. But if he proclaims his innocence, and that's what he intends to do, Max Kellerman is of the mindset that you fight it to the Supreme Court if you have to, or pretty damn close, similar to what Tom Brady did. Because he believes that somehow, some way, that's going to have an impact in a, in a court of public opinion. I say, hell no. Take your behind and go home. And it ain't just because of the notion where there's smoke, there's fire. Five separate incidences over three separate days? July 17th, 19th, and 21st of last year? You innocent in all of them? All of them? How the hell you allow yourself in that situation if you're so innocent? Five times? But even if some miracle happened and you were innocent of it all, here's the problem. You can't sway the court of public opinion anyway. This ain't the court of law. You weren't arrested. You weren't prosecuted. You weren't indicted. This is a court of public opinion. How the hell can you win that? What you going through all of that for? So everybody knows. One press conference for an hour. Taking questions from the media while emphatically stating your innocence. If that is indeed what you are, Ezekiel Elliott, should do the trick. Period. Taking this to all layers of the courts? Nonsense. NFL doesn't have the burden of proof laid on their shoulders. As they executed against in a, in a whole deflate gate fiasco, all they have to do is say that it's more likely than not that you are guilty of X, Y, and Z in their mind. And as a result, you have stained and sullied the shield We're going to hold you out from playing. Period. Now, if you want to fight to get your money back, you want to fight to have the suspensions reduced based off of that premise, fine. But if you are unsuccessful in this appeal, to have this dragging on more and more and more, that's your name being raked through the coals associated with domestic violence. And how many people are going to believe That you, the same dude who knew you were being investigated but still pulled on a girl's shirt to show her cleavage in public while you were on a boat for a parade. Or was alleged to have been in some kind of altercation in a bar while you were on investigation. Who's giving you the benefit of the doubt? And ladies and gentlemen, that's with this girl being in the report essentially exposed for lying and trying to extort money from him and and threatening to ruin his career and his life. All of that's in the report. And they still gave Ezekiel Elliott six games. Because what they're saying is, regardless of how amoral she may be in all of this, it didn't warrant you putting your hands on her. That's what they're saying. Now, we don't know how guilty Ezekiel Elliott is of any of this. What we do know is what the NFL believes. And since the NFL is judge, jury, executioner, and the appellate court, the only way to wiggle your way around this is to make this every bit as much of a legal issue as Tom Brady did. Tom Brady was fighting for his good name. 
in terms of the fact that he wouldn't cheat the game of football by trying to use deflated footballs to do his thing. If you are Ezekiel Elliott, you are fighting to not have your name associated with domestic violence. And how the hell do you pull that off? By keeping yourself in the news because of it. I just don't get it. I really don't. 866-729-ESPN is the number to call. That's 866-729-3776. Speaking of Houston, what I was talking about earlier, I want to play Max Kellerman's final take on first take today, which I thought was outstanding. And I think everyone of us, all of us needs to hear. So I'll play that a little bit later on in the show. Plus, Dan Rayfield, boxing writer extraordinaire for ESPN.com and ESPN family. He'll be on that line with us to talk about that fight from Saturday night involving Mayweather and McGregor. Stick around. You're listening live to the Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio. Want to be a part of the show? It's Stephen A. Up weekdays from 1 to 3 Eastern at 866-729-3776. You're listening to Love Advice with Leanne. Caller, you're on the air. Uh, hi, Leanne. Long-time listener, first-time caller. <laughs> Why, in your professional opinion, do you never take my calls off the air? Is this Carl? Yep, it's Carl. I mean, we had a few dates. Everything was great, I thought. Uh... Well, you know, when you switch to GEICO, you could save a lot of money on car insurance. Okay, awesome. You should call them. I will. GEICO, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. No charges. Whoever brought against Ezekiel Elliott. However, as the Columbus City Attorney's Office said, the information related to the case was, quote, conflicting and inconsistent. According to ESPN.com's Jean-Jacques Taylor. And you got to remember when the league decided to suspend Elliott. <clears throat> And wrote in a letter that advisors to NFL special counsel for conduct, Todd Jones, felt, quote, there is substantial and persuasive evidence supporting a finding that Elliott engaged in physical violence against Miss Thompson on multiple occasions during the week of July 16th, 2016. What else is there to say? I mean, really. Where are we going here, ladies and gentlemen? I personally don't see how. Ezekiel Elliott can get out of this. And to me, if Roger Goodell in the league office, Mr. Henderson, don't lessen this penalty. You have no recourse. You better hope they do it. Better hope they do it. Listen, and let me remind y'all of Ezekiel Elliott's tweet. Upon learning of a six-game suspension, quote, I am both surprised and disappointed by the NFL's decision today, and I strongly disagree with the league's findings. I recognize the distraction and disruption that all of this has caused my family, friends, teammates, the Dallas Cowboys organization, as well as my fans. For that, I am sincerely sorry. I admit that I am far from perfect, but I plan to continue to work very hard on and off the field to mature and earn the great opportunity that I have been given. Ladies and gentlemen, did you hear anything there that... He, where he said, I'm innocent. Did he say anything there? Ladies and gentlemen, can we put this in perspective, please? But now you're going to go up to Roger Goodell's office and try to claim what? What exactly? I'm just asking. I'm just asking. Let's go to Kevin in New Jersey. You're live with Stephen A. What's up, Kev? Hey, Stephen A. Good afternoon. Go ahead. Listen, I said this before, and I'll say it again. He did it. <laughs> he did it. I don't listen. This has nothing to do with white, black, blue, or green. I'm a black man of a certain age. I'm a mm -hmm. Dallas Cowboy fan, mm -hmm. and I have daughters. Mm -hmm. He did it. He can sit you. here and tap dance all he wants, but I want to ask you a question, Stephen A. Smith. Yes, sir. Where in God's name was her mother and father or someone to pull her out of that situation 
when it first happened. Okay, when it second happened, when it third happened, when it yeah. where? Well, the, the, the only part that gets tricky about that, sir, is that um, you're on a college campus. You just never know. I mean, sometimes things happen so quickly. You know, it was over a five-day span, but, you know, you're away at college. But I will say this. On at least two occasions, you know, they talked about how her mother took pictures or something like that. I don't know. I really don't know how to answer that question, man. Well, I thank you, uh, Stephen A. Smith, for being on the air. You are very passionate about what you do. I appreciate everything you do and say. Have a good day. I'm going to be listening to the rest of the show. God bless. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I appreciate it. Look, all I'm saying is this. You know, this notion that this guy should be fighting with the league office over such, I don't understand how that works for you. I really, really don't. I don't get that. This isn't deflated footballs. And even with the deflated football issue, I kept saying, Tom Brady, take your punishment, man. Fight for what? You ain't going to beat the commissioner. You're going to serve them four games. That's exactly what I said. And I kept saying it. And people are like, no, no, you got to fight to that out. Please stop it. Football's were deflated. Serve the games. Because the more you fought the commissioner, the more he was going to hunker down. Because you're trying to challenge the power of the commissioner's office. And he wasn't going to let you do that. You are entitled to appeal. That's collectively bargained. He is entitled to assign somebody to hear the case. That's collectively bargained. But once you take it to that next level, now you're challenging the power of the commissioner's office. And it's one thing when you're Tom Brady and the issue is deflated football. This is domestic violence. And all you got in the NFL is one year under your belt. And you think you're going to usurp the power of the commissioner's office? What drug y'all smoking? He better drop this and move on. All right, get your appeal heard today. Try to get some of that money back. Try to get the penalty of the games lessened. I get it. But if it fails here, go home. You don't want to be in the news for all of this. You don't want it. I'm sorry. That's just how I feel about it. Terrence in the Bronx, you're live with Stephen A. What's up, man? Stephen A., you, hey, man, I, I love your work. I watch all your shows. You are Thank absolutely you. right. This guy, if you're, if you're innocent, you scream it from the high heavens. And, and, and those words you said, he never said, I did not do it. So to me, that says that he's culpable with that situation. Number one, it's the same guy, draft night, got caught having sex. We're like a girl who put it on Instagram or whatever. This guy oh, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. That has nothing to do with this. I mean, who he decided to hook up with, as long as it's consensual and they're adults, that's none of our business. You're absolutely right. I'm just saying, in terms of him, him thinking clearly, this guy. I'm just saying, a night, a night like a night like the night you get drafted in the NFL and you suddenly recognize you're going to be a millionaire just to be a professional athlete. That would be you'd be in that kind of mood. I, I know, can't knock somebody, him for that. No, you I understand. I'm just saying his judgment. That just calls into play his judgment. With well, if she's the one that put it on Instagram instead of him, how is that his judgment? Well, he fell asleep with a, with a girl he just met that night. I understand what you're saying, Stephen. I, okay. Go past that. You're right. But in terms of pulling up the shirt, when you, when you, when you come in the league, you got to understand you got to always protect the shield. And I don't think he's done his best to try to protect the shield. You should take his six games. Sit down, get his mind right, go see some people, try to, you know, be with his family, because I know he embarrasses his family. I know it's supposed his family's a good well, family. Well, his, his father don't seem as embarrassed. His father seems defiant that his son is innocent and he's determined to clear his name. Oh, that's wrong. He needs to call, you know, he needs to, he needs to basically. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm getting from help. Pops. All he right. Needs to get some help. I appreciate it. No problem. 866-729-ESPN. It's 866-729-3776. We'll continue with the Stephen A. Smith Show. Get a little bit to, into the Kyrie Irving, um, LeBron James um, situation in Cleveland, and, of course, the trade for Kyrie Irving to Boston and how it has the potential to fall apart. We'll revisit that subject and then some. So stick around. It's the Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it. Get back to the phone calls on Ezekiel Elliott before I get to Dan Rayfield. 
talking about Mayweather McGregor's fight uh, Saturday night, which is expected to generate an excess of seven hundred million dollars, a seventy to thirty percent split for Mayweather with McGregor. Before I get into any of that, let me also bring this up to uh, the hearing for the trade in regards to um, or the deadline for, you know, everything that goes with it for Kyrie Irving going to Boston in exchange for Isaiah Thomas, Jay Crowder, uh, some European player in the first round uh, pick that belonged to the Brooklyn Nets that, that Boston got in, the, in trading Paul Pierce and KG there. Before I go into any of that, um, let me make sure I let y'all know that, you know, it's going to be a dicey situation. There's no way around it. It's going to be a dicey situation uh, for Cleveland and Boston. If you're Cleveland, Kyrie wants out. Even though I'm telling you I've spoken to numerous players on that team and they all love Kyrie and want him to stay. You're Cleveland brass. You don't want to bring Kyrie back because Kyrie Irving and LeBron James don't need to be in the same locker room for this upcoming season because it'll be an absolute circus. So that much is a given. <clears throat> in the case of Boston, might be even worse because you don't want to, you don't want to bring Isaiah Thomas back because Isaiah Thomas desperately wanted to stay in Boston and his feelings were hurt that he got traded, and he knows that he got traded because. Danny Ainge and the Boston Celtics don't want to give him max dollars at $177 million. That's why Isaiah Thomas got got traded. He's hurt by it. He's emotional about it. And if you're Danny Ainge and those guys, you don't want to bring Isaiah Thomas back. You really, really don't. You want to make sure that, you know, this just trade is consummated so you can move on with Kyrie and Isaiah Thomas can move on with his life. And be clear, Kyrie Irving, I'm sorry, Isaiah Thomas is not just hurt because he was traded. He's hurt because of why he was traded. Danny H could bring up hip injuries and all this stuff all he wants to. Isaiah Thomas could be 100% healthy. He's 5'9". And Danny H is reluctant to dole out $177 million to this kid. Even though he averaged 28 a game, even though he was third in the league MVP voting and all of this other stuff, Danny H and those guys are reluctant in Boston to give Isaiah Thomas that money. Isaiah Thomas would not be salty if they got if they paid him money and traded him. What he's salty about is that he gave his heart and soul, his blood, sweat, and tears to Boston. Even after his sister died, he didn't take any time off. He showed up back on that court and he performed and he balled. And Isaiah Thomas's position in all likelihood is, damn, I just want to get paid. You know, if they paid him and then traded him, he might not have liked it, but there would be nothing to be salty about because at least he got his money. But they traded him entering the last year of his deal with his hip not 100% healthy. And as a result, he's got to wonder whether or not he's going to be healthy enough to perform. And because that's up in the air, it's also up in the air whether or not he'll get his money. That's what's driving Isaiah crazy. But we'll see what happens. You know, as it pertains to Carmelo Anthony, I don't know what the hell is going on. He wants to go to Houston. Doesn't look like that's going to happen, ladies and gentlemen. Doesn't look like Houston can find the third team. Maybe a miracle could happen and it could change up and they can end up finding that, but it doesn't look like that right now. We shall see what happens. Chris in L.A., you're live with Stephen A. What's up? Hey, Stephen A. Uh, Just real quick, I want to touch on the whole Kyrie, Isaiah thing. I agree with you 1,000%. I don't believe that Kyrie can't be back in Cleveland. And I listen to you say that there's guys, you've heard guys say that they would embrace him back, but it's not about any of those other guys. It's about 23 in that uniform. Like if LeBron and Kyrie have friction, then it won't work. And it's also, you also have to take in consideration that we don't know if LeBron's going to be there after this season. So I don't blame Kyrie one bit for wanting to take his own rights into controlling controls on destiny. So we can't be mad at him. I think, uh-huh. I think, I think my, re- I think my reticence in regards to Kyrie Irving and the media and everybody else, don't paint this guy as a bad guy. He's not a bad guy. You know, he's a champion. And if he has the confidence in himself that he could go someplace else and be a number one option and make things happen, I don't think we should have a problem with that. I don't think we should treat him like he's some scrub that's overplaying his hand. Kyrie's a bad somebody, man. This brother can ball. 
let's show respect where it's due. I'm not saying you're not, but there's some people that haven't, and I think they're wrong. But go ahead, Chris. I, I, I agree, Stephen A. All right, and real quick about the Isaiah thing, and, I, and, and you're right on that as well. I, I actually feel bad for him because you've got a guy who put out last year was in the MVP discussion, but now he's going to have to potentially perform for another team to try to prove to them why he's worth the X amount of dollars that he believes he's worth. That's in, in case of point to what you said about him, even if he got paid and got traded, he wouldn't be, as you put it, saucy. But now he didn't get paid, but they traded him. He's going to have to go out and, and, and it's up in the air, and it's up in the air whether or not he's going to get paid because he's not 100 percent out. Exactly, Stephen. And so I agree 1,000 percent that Isaiah should be upset. So with that being said, what do you think happens on Thursday if the trade is vetoed? It doesn't I, go through. I don't think happens? the trade gets vetoed. I don't think the trade gets vetoed. I think they'll find a way to work it out, even if it okay. means neither gets. Uh, I think that, that I think Cleveland's got a chance to at least get another second round pick. That's about it. I don't but think Boston anything else. Anything else in return? No. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, you Boston get nothing. Re- no, Boston ain't getting nothing in return. Boston ain't getting. Okay. But na- Boston, not, Boston not getting nothing and not getting anything in return. I think Cleveland's got a chance to get another pick. But if you Boston, you actually could ask for something considering all that you gave away. You never know. Right, you never so know. So Cleveland right, got to be careful. Thank you. Take care, man. Thanks a lot. Let's go to Philip in Texas. You're live with Stephen A. What's up? Hey, Stephen A., I appreciate you taking my call. Thank you. I was right. actually uh, wanted to, just real quick, I wanted to talk about uh, Isaiah. Don't you think that it's a little much for him to be asking? I understood that he uh, played one year at a max contract uh, play, but he's asking for four years max contract whenever he's really only got that one good year under his belt. Whoa, 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 whoa. He averaged 29 points a game. He averaged over 20 the year before. He's proven himself to be a miniature scoring machine in the NBA. And by the way, he's been in the league for years. This man is getting $6.2 million, man. Kyle Lowry is getting paid more than him. John Wall is getting paid more than him. And think about the numbers that they have on the table. While Kyrie is in the midst of a $90 million contract, Phillip, Kyle Lowry is getting over $150 million. You've got John Wall who signed a $170 million extension. you got Steph Curry who got $207 million. you got Russell Westbrook who literally has a $217 million extension waiting for him on the table to sign. The only one of them who are champions is Steph Curry. And oh, by the way, the Clippers were willing to give the 32-year-old Chris Paul $207 million. These are guys that are getting over a hundred million dollars more than Kyrie Irving. You don't think he should have a problem with that? I'm I'm just saying that a lot of them have played at a high level for a long time, and there's a reason that what, they have what been level, traded around. What level, hold on, hold on. what level has Kyle Lowry, John Wall, or even a Russell Westbrook or a Chris Paul played? to the point that they deserve more than $100 million more than Kyrie Irving. No, I'm not saying that he, he shouldn't get a, a extremely good pay raise, but I'm not sure I would give him a max value contract. I think I think Kyrie Irving in today's NBA climate is worth max dollars. You See, see here's where your thinking goes awry, Philip. okay? Your whole thing is, is that are you a superstar or are you box office, right? Ain't that what you're thinking? Huh, Philip? Yes, sir. Okay, let me ask you this question. How many guys are there? How many guys are those in the league? Uh, I wouldn't even be able to guess. I mean, I'm sure. You, could, you couldn't the name ones seven. I'm thinking, I'm you sure could, top you, ten. You, could, you couldn't name seven. So what I'm saying to you is this. There's 30 teams in the NBA. Don't tell me that Kyrie can't be a number one option for somebody. Brendan Hay, I mean, you know, Gordon Haywood just signed for 130 million. 130 million. I'm sorry. Kyrie's worth that. He is. Gotta go. Give Stephen A. a piece of your mind. He is sorry. Call him weekdays from 1 to 3 Eastern. I mean, just trash. At 866-729-3776. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it.
Let's go to Wendell in L.A. You're live with Stephen A. What's up? Hey, greetings, Stephen A., man. I like that William Devon you played in the background. No doubt. And now, Stephen, this is just my own personal uh, uh, opinion, but I think the NFL should restructure the office of the commissioner and get like a five-member committee and call it a commission. You know, maybe you have like a couple For what of purpose? players. For what purpose? Bit, well, to 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 to... to Hand down suspensions and fines. You, instead of putting the honors on just one person, you would have a five member committee, two ex players maybe, one person that was in the uh, uh, upper management, and you would you you would a diverse cross section of people in there. I mean, because like I said, I mean, I mean, I don't, I don't knock the job that Goodell is doing, but I think it'd be better off if, if I would embrace more diversity as far as someone actually overseeing the whole NFL operation. Well, everybody feels that way um, in terms of power being stripped of Roger Goodell. He shouldn't be, you know, um, in, in, in the the influential position that he's in, not to this degree. But, again, it was collectively bargained, and that's something that the Players Association surrendered. And that was the mistake that they made. And, by the way, how come nobody asked this question, Wendell? What the hell was the Players Association doing signing a 10-year collective bargaining uh, deal with the NFL anyway? That's another story, you know. I mean, I mean, that's a the, the NFL players need new leadership. Also, I'm go. thinking people like Alan Page, Chris Collinsworth, to probably step in in either position and do a more admirable job. Got you. Appreciate the call, man. Thank you so much, Drew. You're live with Stephen A. Go ahead, man. Hey, Stephen A. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, right. Long time listener. Uh, I wanted to touch on the Kyrie situation right quick. Uh, I you uh, about a week ago on first take, you had said that. Uh, LeBron James would be under more pressure uh, after the trade, assuming that it goes through. But correct. I actually think that Ky- – I'm sorry? I said correct. Yes, I actually think that Kyrie would be under more pressure, and here's why. I think that the city that he's going into, they demand championships. They demand excellence out of everybody. You go in Boston, you see all the Raptors and everything else, and they're thinking that Kyrie is going to be the second coming of the championships that they've had. LeBron, you know, he's going to have That is false. They don't believe that, but go ahead. That's false. They don't believe that, but go ahead. Okay. And then uh LeBron, you know, they that you know, a lot of people are already saying they're not re- they're not really expecting him to beat the Warriors even if even if he has this squad that that he has. So I just don't I just don't think that he would be under nearly as much pressure as Kyrie. And I just well, think here's, that he, Well, here's why I disagree with you. Number 1, even with Gordon Haywood and Kyrie Irving, the expectation is that Boston would be the dominant team once LeBron James decides to take his talents elsewhere following next season. That's number one. Number two, because Cleveland is better due to the deal, assuming everybody is healthy, even though Golden State is your favorite, LeBron's the best player in the world. And because he's the best player in the world and clearly would be with a better team now than he was last year, there are those that are going to look at him and say, we don't give a damn that we, we put somebody else as the favorite. What you going to do about it? Because you're the best in the world, and you got an army of, of, of ball players that can get it done for you. What's your problem? Don't think for one second they won't ask him that. I got you. I got you. Yeah, I just think that I just think that there's there's going to be a lot of pressure on Kyrie if he doesn't deliver in Boston. No, he's going to have to play well, but he could lose to Cleveland because they're still considered the, an inferior team. Thanks a lot. Let's go to Cam. You're live with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. What's up, man? Hey, Stephen A. What's going on, man? I'm good. Talk no, to me. No, there's no man questions today, but I have a uh, question about the Zika Elliott. I know all week you've preference about if Zika Elliott suspended, you see the Giants winning the division. Um, I'm an Eagles fan. What does the Eagles have to do to get your respect? Well, Doug Peterson is my question mark. I like Carson Wentz a lot. I'm wondering what they're going to do with their backfield. I mean, when Lane Johnson went down on the offensive line last year, they didn't know what to do. I like Alshon Jeffrey. I don't know it was worth getting rid of of, of uh, Jordan Matthews. And I just look at them, and I say the talent is there. They can get it done, but I do think that the Giants are just better because I think their passing attack is elite, and I think their bench, their bench – I'm sorry, their defense – it's relatively better. And the Cowboys in that formidable running game can be nightmarish for everybody. That's where I'm at. Okay. With. Okay. And this is not a non football sports question, but I'm expecting the little girl 
any day now, and my wife and I are torn between names. I maybe just want your opinion. Um, do you like Cambry Ray or Cambry Reagan? Why I gotta be Cam- Why, why I gotta be Why I gotta be Cambry? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Why I gotta be Cambry? Why? Why? Well, where that come from? I'm interested to know where that come from. Well, my name's Kamari, and. I, I like to go, I like and it, Cambry is one of those things where like we want to add my name part of my name to it like right. I have a daughter named Rose so she likes mm-hmm. Rose so I I didn't want to name my baby after another flower How about Cambry Angel I like that I like that a lot How about Cambry Angel as a middle name because after all okay. is that your first daughter Second daughter this is my second Okay, okay. because you know what yeah. Angel and Princess always works for me when it comes to little ladies. It's something in their name, okay. and when you put that up in there, it reminds them of how valuable they are and how valuable they should be to any man that encounters them because their father is going to love them dearly, and she's going to be precious to you. And anybody that comes to, into her life after you had better recognize that she needs to be treated special. That's why you give her yes, names sir. like that. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. No problem. Have a nice day. I'm love, Doc. Now get on out of here. <laughs> That's Mart Large, y'all. Let's be stealing from Mart Large. 866-729-ESPN is the number to call. It's 866 3776 about 15 minutes past the hour. Dan Rayfield, boxing writer extraordinaire for ESPN, ESPN.com. He will be on the line with us talking about Saturday night's fight between Mayweather and McGregor. And, of course, I got more to get into in regards to Ezekiel Elliott into the Kyrie trade and Art Browse and the University of Baylor. Stay tuned. Lots to get into. Hour number two up next. That's just a sample of what you'll hear on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Channel 80 and the ESPN app. Check out ESPN Films' newly released 30 for 30 podcasts. From the producers of our award-winning documentary series, this is an amazing collection of sports stories you need to hear to believe. Speaking of amazing, Delta Airlines and the Fly Delta app make your travel experience amazingly easy with real-time bag tracking, e-boarding, and passport scanning during check-in. And don't forget to download 30 for 30 podcasts to fill your flight with stories that will keep you coming back for more. This this is the Stephen A. Smith Show Podcast. I'm Stephen A. Hour number two. The Stephen A. Smith Show here with you for the next hour or so over the airways of ESPN Radio, Sirius XM, Channel 80. Number to call up as always is 866-729-ESPN. That's 866-729-3776. Looking at a tweet. It's rare that I get to look at my tweets during the show, but I lucked up and did it this time. Kevin Crawford at Cav underscore Craw tweeted 30 minutes ago, the young lady in the draft night picture is the same young lady Ezekiel Elliott allegedly assaulted. Not a random hookup. Okay, I didn't know. So when the caller called up and was talking about he was with somebody on draft night, I didn't know that was the same lady. Had no clue. Just wanted to make sure I, I, you know, I didn't know that. Have no clue whatsoever. It still doesn't change my position on Ezekiel Elliott, though. I stand by what I said. Staying on football, before we get to Dan Rayfield, about 15 minutes past the hour, talking to us about the boxing event from Saturday night with Mayweather and McGregor. Matthew Stafford is now the highest paid, you know, has the highest annual salary in NFL history. $27 million he's getting paid. $90 million in guaranteed. A new $135 million deal. Let me say this about the quarterback that threw for 4,300-plus yards last year, 24 touchdowns, just 10 interceptions, eight comeback, eight fourth-quarter comebacks. And by the way, he's got a lot of comeback victories on his resume throughout the years. Let me say this about Matthew Stafford. I have nothing against him. I think he's a hell of a quarterback. I think that he can really play. And I think last year, when you consider how suspect the offensive line was, how they had the 30th-ranked rushing attack in the NFL, particularly since Amir Abdullah went down in game two, I get it. I totally understand. Here's my problem. I got a pro- I don't give a damn if it's a penny less. I got a problem with the highest-paid player in the NFL 
being somebody that's been a quarterback for eight years in the NFL and has never won a playoff game. I just have a problem with that. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying he don't deserve $27 million. I'm saying if he's getting $27 million, give me somebody that gets 27.1. Who's actually won in a postseason. I don't like rewards for mediocrity when it counts. I don't like it. And when I think about Matthew Stafford, unfortunately, that's what I'm forced to think about at this moment in time. I'm thinking about a Lions quarterback or a quarterback for the Detroit Lions who haven't won a playoff game since 1991. I'm thinking about a guy who's been there eight full years and only made the playoffs three times. I'm thinking about all three times they lost in the playoffs so they never won a playoff game, period. That's what I'm thinking about. And then I'm saying $27 million? Highest paid quarterback in the NFL. Really? That's what, that's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. One of the other things that I wanted to do as my producers get me that final take, I wanted to give my man Max Kellerman some props. Did a final take today. Um, on a catastrophe that's taking place, Hurricane Harvey in Houston, Texas, and its surrounding areas. It's ravaged that area. So many people need our help, our love, our support. We should all be willing to give what we can. But I wanted to play Max Kellerman's final take for y'all. Just wanted y'all to hear this. And share it with y'all because I think it was a very poignant message on his part and it deserves our attention. Listen to Max Kellerman on first take this morning. Who's your favorite football player right now? Personally, I tend to favor the kind of player who toils bravely and selflessly for the betterment of the New York football giants and their millions of righteous and devoted fans. And the special designation of favorite can vary. Wide receiver David Tyree spent more than a minute as my guy about 10 years ago. Know what I mean? But right now, my number one guy is a different kind of giant. He's a Texan. As you know, the remnants of Hurricane Harvey continue to dump unprecedented and unmanageable amounts of rain on the Texas Gulf Coast, the city of Houston, and soon the state of Louisiana. The stories and images of heroic people risking their own safety for the safety of neighbors and of perfect strangers are nothing less than inspiring. Things are bad down there. And those life-threatening conditions have brought out the very best in people. And one of those people is Houston Texan superstar J.J. Watt. He donated $100,000 to support rescue and relief efforts in Houston. $100,000. New Rocket Chris Paul stepped up with $50,000. And Watt's initiative has now led to more than a million dollars donated so far by people like you. That's leadership. The people of that region would surely rather be thinking and talking and arguing about football than dealing with the devastation around them. But now's not the time. For those of us with the good fortune to have time to carry on with our normal routines, this is a good time to remember what's really important about being a neighbor and a countryman. It's not about football games or basketball trades. It's about having each other's backs. There are a ton of ways for each of us to help. We'll put links up on our social handles. However you can help, whichever organization you choose to support, take a minute today and do it. Millions of you have already have, and you know how right and good it feels. So yeah, there will soon come a time when Odell Beckham or Eli Manning or maybe Landon Collins, the way he's been playing, is back to being my favorite football player. But right now, while the whole country gets together to help out the people of Southeast Texas... I'm a J.J. Watt guy. That was my brother, my man, Max Kellerman, doing his thing on Final Take today on First Take. Proud of him. He's absolutely right. Anything that we can do, you know, think about it. Think about the GoFundMe uh, accounts that exist out there and, and people trying to generate funds to help those in need ravaged by Hurricane and, uh, Hurricane Harvey. Just think about that. And do what you can. 866-729-ESPN. That's 866-729-3776. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing that's transpiring even in the face of this catastrophe. Because at a time where just weeks removed 
from being as divided as a nation as we've appeared to be in quite a long time. Here we are extending a helping hand in an effort to uplift so many others so desperately in need. Showing the true spirit of America and what we really, really stand for. 44th president of the United States, Barack Obama was down in Houston on the streets, helping folks out. He shouldn't be alone. And he isn't. 866 espn It's 866 Let's go back to the phone. Let's go to Stretch in Chicago. You're live with Stephen A. Long time no here, buddy. How you doing, my man? What's up, Stephen A? How you feel, man? I'm good, man. Thanks for calling. Go ahead, bro. Man, just uh, Danny Ainge on uh, Isaiah Thomas, man. Yep. He need to go and do right by him. Because there's no way they the one that series against us without... Isaiah Thomas coming back out just sister. Yeah, dad. that's true, but it's a little bit too late for that, bro. Well, you already traded. You already traded. No effect. Okay. Just hear me out on this. He he came back. They won the series. They went on to beat Washington. They played Cleveland. So then he said, "Okay, we got something going on here." So then he was able to pull the trade with Gordon Haywood. Once he was able to pull the court, the trade with Gordon Haywood, he said, "Oh man." I got the player who I wanted anyway. My whole my whole take on it is, if if he would have never came back and showed some lower D to Danny Ainge in Game Three of the, uh, of our series, he would have never had a chance to get Gordon Haywood. Because Gordon Haywood said, "Oh stop, man, we good." Stop right there. Stop, 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 stop right there. Stretch. I'm here for you, bro. You're wrong. Gordon Haywood played in college at Butler for Brad Stevens. No matter what happened, he was going to Boston. I'm telling you what I know. He was coming to Boston. So that's not true. And secondly, stretch. Isaiah Thomas is underpaid. That abs- that's absolutely true. But, but, but he wasn't playing for free, bro. He still had a job to do. He's getting paid $6 million. He still had a job to do. So I don't want to hear this where, you know what, you know, appreciate this man. You know, when he's a free agent, you got to pay him. But if he's under contract, he's got a job to do, and he's supposed to do it. Wouldn't you say that, Stretch? Yeah, but see, here's the thing. This is the difference between this. I'm coming, I'm coming from this perspective. Derrick Rose was hurt every year when they lost that first-round series against Philly when he tore his ACL. Okay. Okay? I got John you. Paxson did right by Derrick Rose. And where'd that get him? And where'd that get him, Stretch? Where'd that get him, Stretch? This is what you're talking about, loyalty, Stephen A. No, 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 I'm at, no, 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 no. I asked you a question. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't give me a motion. I want fact. Where did that get y'all? You right there in Chicago. Where did that, where did, where did, did giving Derrick Rose that contract get y'all? This one, this one, he got this. Derrick Rose, Derrick Rose put out everything. What I'm getting at is this here. Derek Come on, Rose Dretch. You dancing. Everything you dancing. You dancing, bro. The career. What I'm getting at is he got us to he got us to the finals to play with LeBron. What? Danny Ainge. I mean, not Danny Ainge. Whoa, 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 whoa. No. Derrick Rose did that before he got hurt, not after. When he got hurt. He got hurt. So what I'm saying to you is, that, and by the way, he signed for $90 million before he went down, not after. What I'm saying to you is this. Where would that have gotten them had they given Derrick Rose the money after he got hurt? We was going to take care. We take care of our people. Just, Come you know, on, we bro. Say, no, no, no. You that, that stretch, I got to go. I got to go. We got to talk another time. You being emotional. You're not being factual, bro. You're not being factual. And you're not being practical. You got a cap. You give money to a dude that ain't healthy. You're taking it away from someone who is. That's just the truth. I mean, this, this ain't church, bro. This is business. That's just the way it is. You got to get the leverage and exercise the leverage while you got it. Stop acting like people are old. 
It ain't that simple. I'm not saying sometimes it don't apply, but it ain't that simple. 866-729-ESPN. Dan Rayfield, boxing rider extraordinaire, up next with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Catch the Stephen A. Smith Show live on 98.7 ESPN New York, ESPN LA 710, and Sirius XM Channel 80. You just can't make this stuff up. Weekdays from 1 to 3 Eastern. You're listening to Love Advice with Leanne. Caller, you're on the air. Uh, hi, Leanne. Long-time listener, first-time caller. <laughs> Why, in your professional opinion, do you never take my calls off the air? Is this Carl? Yep, it's Carl. I mean, we had a few dates. Everything was great, I thought. Uh... Well, you know, when you switch to GEICO, you could save a lot of money on car insurance. Okay, awesome. You should call them. I will. GEICO, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. It's always my honor and privilege to have my next guest on the line, boxing writer extraordinaire. ESPN, ESPN.com, does a fen- phenomenal job of covering the sport. I'm talking about my man Dan Rayfield. He's on the line with yours truly right now. What's going on, big boy? How are you, man? How's everything? Stephen A., everything is good. I'm rested and recharged from a big week in Vegas. Uh, how big of a week was it for you considering how much you love and cherish and know about this sport of boxing and how suspect it was coming into the uh, to, into the event because Conor McGregor was a UFC fighter. How do you view the weekend? I mean, it was a big week. Uh, I have to be honest, though, in terms of, like, the overall atmosphere and the overall intensity of the fans and the and just uh, the, the hype, I didn't feel it as much as I have had for other fights, even though it may end up breaking the pay-per-view record. We don't have those numbers quite yet. But, uh, but don't get me wrong, it was a big event. But, like, think, for example, like the weigh-in, it was a scene, but it wasn't the same kind of scene as uh, I was at for, say, Hatton versus Mayweather. Granted, it was in a smaller space, but that was absolutely as intense as it gets. Mayweather Pacquiao, which filled up the entirety of the Grand Garden Arena. Mayweather Canelo Alvarez, which filled up the entirety of the arena as well. Um, but it was a big event. I had, I had somewhat low expectations for the fight, so it actually exceeded my expectations because it turned out to be decent. But what I found to be funny about it was I heard from a lot of people who hadn't really watched a lot of boxing, friends of, you know, of, our, of, of mine and my wife at home who were really into it, who had, you know, really couldn't look forward, who looked forward to buying it and watching it, who came away going, that was great, that was great. I'm like, man, I'm glad you liked it because now what's going to happen if those people decide to give a, a better fight on paper a chance that turns out to be a great fight, like, say, for example, the, the Gennady Golovkin and Canelo Alvarez fight, then you'll really know what real top-level boxing is. So I'm happy that the people who bought the fight didn't walk away from it disappointed thinking like they wasted their money or I'm never going to buy another fight in my life. Um, but for those of us who really know what good boxing is, that was not good boxing. I looked at Mayweather. I never saw him look worse in my estimation. I think that I'm glad that he announced that he's retiring, that he, he seems as serious as ever, that he will not fight anymore because I think one of these young lions would have knocked Mayweather out based off of how he looked this past Saturday night. What about you? That is basically exactly what I wrote in my Monday column, which is that Mayweather, uh, for the first time ever, showed his age. The layoff was there. I mean, I'll give you an example. When, when he came back after like about a 16-month layoff or so to fight Juan Manuel Marquez, mm-hmm. he looked as good as he ever looked in his entire life. Look, he never missed a day in the gym. Like, it was just business as usual. And that was against a Hall of Fame fighter, granted a guy who was coming up a little bit in weight, but nonetheless, a, a tremendous uh, all-time great uh, Mexican fighter like Juan Manuel Marquez, multiple weight class division champion, yep. you know, been in some of the biggest fights. He looked great. Against McGregor, nah, it didn't look so good. Those legs looked a little rickety, looked a little old, took some shots, and Floyd can say all he wants that that was by design, that he wanted to make up for the Pacquiao uh, stinker, that he was going to go forward and make it a real fight. But you know what? When you get to be 40 and you're coming off a two-year layoff, those legs don't allow you to do the things that you wanted to do. So that's why older fighters sometimes make for better fights because they're forced to stand and mix it up a little bit more than if they still had that great speed and reflexes, which Floyd still has some of, obviously. He's still a fantastic athlete, but it's not what it was not that long ago. And he even said, I'm not the same fighter I was 20 years or 10 years ago or even two years ago. So I don't believe for one moment that Floyd purposely let the guy hit him because that's never been Floyd's game and old dogs don't change their spots. That's just a fact of life. Now, he was able to disguise that uh, perhaps uh, slippage because he was in with a guy that had no experience and really didn't know what he was doing in the boxing ring. So it turned out to be a little bit of a better fight. Now, I also am of the opinion, to at least a small degree, that he carried the man a little bit. 
because he did want he didn't want people to walk away from his last fight, you know, uh, yelling bad things and, and and saying they were disgusted what had it occurred. So I do think he might have been able to take him out a little bit sooner if he wanted to. Once he had him under control, that's what he did. He took his time and he took him out the way he should have. Do you believe that Conor McGregor should ever get in a boxing ring again or should go back to the UFC permanently and not even think about it? I think it should be about how much money he can make for whichever fights are offered to him. So if he can make another huge boatload of money to do a boxing match, why not? Mm. I, was, I, mean, I guess like, what I was, like I guess what I was talking about, Dan, I guess what I was talking about was in terms of his skill set. Because, for example, had he been in the ring against any of those young lines that I talked about, they would have took him out inside of four rounds. They wouldn't have missed as many shots as Floyd Money Mayweather missed. That's the way I view it. What about you? I agree, which is why my perspective on whether he should box again would be have to be uh, depending on what the situation is with the opponent. So, for example, if there was a serious move, movement to make a fight between Connor and Malinaji, for example, okay, I can see that. It would probably sell, not to the level of the degree of a Mayweather fight, but there would be a lot of hype, but there would be a lot of discussion. You know, Paulie can talk the way... Uh, just as good as any other uh, trash talker out there. And there would probably be some intrigue in that fight. Um, but as far as him getting in the ring and fighting a, a Triple G or a Canelo or, or an Errol Spence or, you know, a Keith Thurman, no, forget about that. I mean, those are those are fights that are literally not winnable, in my opinion. If you thought mm-hmm. the Mayweather fight was not winnable, he's not beating uh, a Canelo, a Triple G, uh, an Errol Spence, guys like that. In fact, one of the things I wrote in the piece I referenced in my Monday post, uh, you know, second day after column about was – as I said, Mayweather could disguise the slippage because he was in with such a, a fundamentally unsound opponent. But imagine if Mayweather on Saturday night had been in the ring with uh, Gennady Golovkin or an Errol Spence. Those fights would not go well for Mayweather, given what I saw Saturday night. Mm, he was smart. Cool. Floyd did the right look, look. Floyd did the perfect thing. He was comfortable in retirement after the Berto fight. This fight came up. It came out. He said, "What the heck? I can make two hundred some million, maybe more, two fifty, whatever the final number is going to be." He said, th- "He said that over three hundred no million, lose. right?" He said over three hundred and fifty million. That's what he said he was going to make for that one night's work. So Dan Rayfield right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Let's transition because Oscar De La Hoya has made some news. Dan Rayfield because he thought the fight was a farce and he's been going off about it. He's got the promotions <laughs> for Triple G versus Gennady Golovkin. I'm oh, sorry, Triple G versus Canelo on September 16th. Which anybody that loves the sport of boxing and then some is looking forward to. I can't wait for that fight. But why is Oscar De La Hoya opening his mouth? A and B, how do you feel about him denigrating another promotion, another fight? Your thoughts? Unfortunately, in boxing, there's a lot of backbiting between promoters. It's not new. It's not. not it's not anything that's new. If you go back into the to the to the '90s and the '80s, you'd hear uh, there'd be some fight that would be being put on by Top Rank and Bob Arum, and Don King would take hits at it, or there'd be a Don King fight and Bob Arum would take hits at it. That's just the nature of the beast. They're competitive against one another the same way the boxers are. Uh, and I think Oscar also felt uh, the fact that the fight was three weeks before his big fight with Kanadi Golovkin and Canelo Alvarez that it was damaging his promotion which means money out of everybody's pocket. So he was frustrated, and he lashed out, and he's had nothing good to say about the Mayweather-McGregor fight since day one. He, he put out a, uh, a tweet on, on the day of the fight uh, with, with uh, four-letter words that we wouldn't want to say on the radio. Um, and, but, but part of that, in addition to venting his own frustrations, he got some publicity for his own fight because people were talking about the, what he wrote. So it did help him in that sense. And then, of course, you know, once the fight was over Saturday night, they wasted absolutely no time. They have three weeks to get this thing to high gear. They started exactly on Monday with uh, the two fighters doing an open workout in front of, you know, 1,000, 1,500 people in a real nice setting at L.A. Live in downtown Los Angeles right across the street from the Staples Center where both guys did their workouts. They got a lot of media coverage on that, both in terms of uh, articles and videos and stuff like that. So if you're a boxing fan, and you don't know about Canelo Alvarez against Gennady Golovkin, then you've been hiding under a rock for the last year and a half or so. I think with three weeks to go, his fight's going to do just fine. But I think he was taking it a little personal. He has no love loss for Floyd Mayweather to begin with, going back to the deal they cut for their 2007 fight that broke all the records at the time that have since been broken by the uh, Pacquiao-Mayweather fight, as well as what may be even in the future with the numbers that come in on this McGregor fight. So, you know, look, Oscar, uh, he was was being a little emotional, but he'll get over it. What about the principled position that he may have been coming from where, as a world-class fighter and a 10-time champion, his belief is that if you're 49-0 and and recognized as one of the greatest to ever do this, why are you allowing somebody who's never fought as a boxer professionally to even get in the ring with you? What about that principled position? Any shot that that was motivation for what he said? 
I mean, it's possible, but I mean, that's not Floyd's problem. I mean, that's on the commission. I mean, I felt like when the fight was made and I voiced my opinion in a column and I actually had a conversation with members of the Nevada commission just to get their take on it, I didn't feel like the fight should be uh, sanctioned, frankly, because knowing the, the way that they, that they break the stones of matchmakers in Las Vegas, like when you're building, like they have a, let's say you have a, a 3-0 and prospect that was in the Olympics, for example, and you're, you know, you're, getting his feet wet as a professional and you're building up his record and you want to put him in with a guy that's like, you know, two and one, but maybe it hasn't faced the best competition. They'll, they may not let you do that fight. They're really, really hard about certain matches that get done on, on these cards. So now they look like absolute hypocrites because they allowed Floyd Mayweather, 49 and 0, one of the greatest fighters in the history of the sport, the best fighter of his era, a guy that's a, you know, going to walk into the hall of fame to take on a guy that's making his pro boxing debut. So now they're hypocrites. And when they talk about it's only about the health and safety of the fighters, I have a hard time believing that. So, you know, they, they went after the money. Uh, I'm not saying it's the commission's fault. They have a boss. Isn't, you know, he's the governor of Nevada. Obviously, that fight generated untold amount of riches for Clark County and for Las Vegas and all the businesses that are there, the casinos and the restaurants and, and the cab drivers and the Uber drivers and you name it. Um, but they, they did not cover themselves with glory in that fight the way by, the, by approving it. Now, thankfully, nothing bad happened. Connor fought his heart out. Um, the stoppage was good. The referee, Robert Byrd, did a good job handling that situation. Um, but it's going to make you think, not only that, by the way, but the fact that they once they approved the fight, then the fact that they let them go in the smaller gloves, that was another reason yeah. to look down on the commission. But again, all of these issues, that's not on Floyd Mayweather. Floyd Mayweather could have brought them the bout, and they could have said no. But who's saying no to all that money? Dan Rayfield right here with Stephen A., ESPN Radio. Uh, before I let you get on out of here, who do you have, Triple G or Canelo, your early prediction? Uh, great, great fight. Love the fight. I'll put it like this. When it was first uh, brought up, you know, back maybe two years ago or so, when the, the concept of the fight there was there, I loved Triple G in that fight. Thought it would definitely be a big Triple G victory. In the time that has passed, Canelo Alvarez has, uh, I think, gotten better as a fighter. He's started to use uh, his his. He's, a, he's become a two-handed fighter. He throws a lot more and better combinations now. And Triple G, even if though he's still near the top, he has shown maybe a tiny little bit of slippage based on how he got hit against Kell Brook, based on a little bit of struggle against Danny Jacobs, both yep. victories. Um, I think that Canelo is a much more of a live dog now than I did a year ago. So while I still like Golovkin to win the fight, uh, Canelo Alvarez, if he does win, I'll be much, much less surprised than I would have been a year, year and a half ago. Dan, keep up the great work, buddy. Always appreciate you, man. Thanks so much. All right, Stephen. It was good to see you in Vegas. All right, same here, buddy. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. I'll be at this next fight. I can promise you that. Sure. Take it easy, buddy. The one and only Dan Rayfield, boxing writer extraordinaire for ESPN, right here with Stephen A. On ESPN Radio, you heard him tell you his column, his Monday column. It's on ESPN.com. Make sure you go check it out. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! Before I get back to the phones, let me say this. Uh, Art Browse. Former coach at Baylor, was recently hired to be an offensive coach in uh, Canada. Um, and within 12 hours or so, he was relieved uh, because of an uproar about folks, um, you know, essentially bringing him on board. June Jones, former coach at SMU at Hawaii, uh, New Art Bros, brought him on board. Try to give him a chance. University wasn't, or sorry, not the university, but Canadian football team, Hamilton. Uh, they weren't having it. They didn't want any parts of him. Um, Art Browser is the former head football coach. He started at Baylor in 2007. He was fired on May 6, 2016, in the wake of the Pepper Hamilton report. About a month and 10 days later on June 16th, Browse filed a motion accusing Baylor of conflict of interest and wrongful termination, but he withdrew it a day later and settled all contractual matters with Baylor, which announced the settlement a week later. Jim Grove replaced him as the interim head coach and led the team through last season. But on December 8th, Temple's Matt Rule was named a new head coach, replacing Grove. Browse later filed a libel lawsuit against the school, but dropped it in February of 2017. Essentially, he was relieved of his duties, primarily based on negligence, gross negligence. Because on numerous occasions, he was approached about sexual assault being committed by his players and did close to nothing about it. Yesterday, I was on the air and I basically said I had no problem with him getting the job. Here's why I had no problem with him getting the job. Number one, it was a professional sports. It was in Canada and he's not a head coach. 
And my attitude is if you're not in jail, you need a job because if you don't have a job but you're not in jail, you become our problem as a society. That's just my overall belief. Having said that, however, I'm not going to lose any sleep over the fact that our brows can't find a job because I understand what he did was egregious. Here's my thing, though. I'm wondering why everybody stops at Art Browse when it comes to Baylor. Ladies and gentlemen, you remember that scandal involving uh, b- basketball player Patrick Dennehy, who was murdered by teammate Carlton Dotson? And there was an alleged cover-up by Coach Dave Bliss trying to paint Dennehy as a drug dealer to hide the fact that he was giving him funds under the table to be a part of Baylor's program? How about this fact. President Kenneth Starr was fired. Athletic Director Ian McCor was forced to resign. Associate AD Tom Hill was fired. Head of Football Operations Colin Schellinglaw was fired. Title IX Coordinator Patty Crawford, she resigned. And in 2017, January of this year, another former Baylor Title IX officer, Gabrielle Lyons, told Outside the Line she left Baylor in November 2015 after senior administrators ignored her and other investigative complaints that they were short-staffed and needed and needed mental health services to cope with the emotional stress of having to hear so many stories of abuse. Ladies and gentlemen, that doesn't seem like a university problem to you? We're stopping at the football coach when the president's gone, the AD's gone, the associate AD is gone. Title IX administrators are gone. Everywhere you turn that belly, even a woman's basketball coach stuck a chest out was talking about, hey, the hell with everybody. Baylor's a great university, blah, 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 blah. Even though women were being sexually assaulted. There have been 52 separate cases, allegations of rape. If there was ever a program that I think warrants consideration for the death penalty, I would think it's at Baylor. I really would. So that's just the way I look at it in, in terms of, I'm not saying our browsers isn't a problem. I'm saying the problem appears to go far deeper than him. Why are we acting like it doesn't? That's my issue. That's what needs to be said. Want to be a part of the show? It's Stephen A. Up weekdays from 1 to 3 Eastern at 866-729-3776. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! A few minutes left later here right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show ESPN Radio. Let's get to the phones before we get on out of here. Let's go to Geo in Brooklyn. You're live with Stephen A. Go ahead, man. Hey, Stephen. Well said about Baylor, by the way. Um, I want to talk about two names in boxing, and then I'll give you my opinion on the fight. I want to see if you agree. A couple of weeks ago, we spoke. I talked to you about Mikey Garcia against Broner. You said you hadn't seen the boy, but now I, him, I saw him. I saw him that night. Very impressed with him. <laughs> Very impressed with him. But here's the problem. Okay, okay. I don't. If if he fought Lomachenko at 135, I don't know if he That's would win. Problem. That's what and I, I was think, going. And I think, I and I think, and I think he's too small for Crawford. Exactly. Now, going That's to Crawford, the problem. Crawford is special. And yes. I think Mayweather, even Mayweather in his prime, would have a hard time with Crawford. That said, I would love to see Crawford and Thurman. What do you think? Well, we got to see Crawford move up to 147 and see how he handles 147. He definitely wants to move up. Well, he has to because there's nobody else in his division for him to make money off of. Okay. Now, That's the problem. Okay, now my prediction on the um, Canelo and Triple G fight, I've got Canelo winning that fight, and whoever wins that fight, I would love to see any of them fight one of the twins, the Charlo brothers. What do you think? I lo- hey, I, I, like, I, I like this kid, Charlo. I'm talking about the one that just had the knockout. Which one is yes. that? He's the, I think he's a little bit of the bigger one out of the. They're twins, but one's a little bigger. I think that's Jamel. That's Jamel Charles. Jamel is his name. That that's who I like. The undefeated yes. knockout odds. I like Charlo a lot. 
I like him yeah. a lot. He's got potential. But isn't that junior middleweight? Um, no, no. It's uh... are you sure? I think let's, let's talk about this tomorrow. But I think it's junior middleweight. But call me back about that tomorrow, man. Thanks a lot for the call. Let's go to Kay in Connecticut. You're live with Stephen A. Go ahead, man. Hey, good afternoon, Steve. Hey, I got a question for you. I was a little, not upset, but a little felt different now when you said Floyd Mayweather wouldn't uh, be able to handle those guys. Uh, I just think no. That I'm just talking about really based. Train. I'm talking about based on Saturday's performance. That's all. Don't get literal. In other words, oh, how nah, he nah. looked Saturday, how he looks at that person that we saw Saturday. That's all I'm saying. Yep. yep. But now, I mean, I, I think. As far as the winner of Triple G and uh, Canelo, I really think Canelo has his fight because he he has the package. He don't have the whole package, but he has the package. You could be right, but I'm going with Triple G. And what do you think if he calls out uh, Floyd after that? Excuse me? What do you think if Triple G, I mean, uh, Canelo calls out Floyd after that? No, Floyd is done. Floyd ain't fighting again, man. I've been talking to him for the last three weeks, man. He ain't fighting again. It's a wrap. I believe it's over. I would be shocked if he, especially after he just looked against uh, Conor McGregor, I'd be shocked if Floyd fought again. I really, really would. Appreciate the call. Mel and Queens, you're live with Stephen A. Go ahead, Mel. Hey, what's going on, Stephen A.? Uh, I want to say that I believe that uh, the Cavs so far got the better deal, you know, with the Kyrie Irving um, situation. Right. I would love to see how, you know, Isaiah Thomas would have looked with all the new pieces, but we never, we never get a chance to see that. But I would like to say that I know I keep hearing you say a lot that, you know, if LeBron loses to Golden State, he's the best player in the world. And I get that. Yes, LeBron is the best player in the world. But a lot of times when we judge LeBron, we don't judge him the same way we judge Michael because Michael was supposed to be the best player for a long time. But he never beat any, like, real super teams. He lost to all the super teams and all the great teams. So all the teams he beat in the finals were teams that he was supposed to beat. No, none of those teams we could say, oh, well, the Bulls were outmatched. So when we look at, like, Golden State last year with Kevin Durant or maybe Golden State this year or maybe LeBron's first year, when we judge the the GOAT, I think we got to keep in consideration that as well and judge the way we judge Michael. Nobody expected no, Michael to be Listen, I, 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 Michael's the standard. I don't, I, I don't deviate from that. And as far as I'm concerned, if you six for six with six NBA Finals MVPs, you ain't got to worry about somebody who lost five NBA Finals be you, usurping you. I don't believe it. Got to go. Appreciate it. Marcus in Alabama, you're live with Stephen A. What's up, Marcus? How you doing, Mr. Stephen A.? Big fan. I just right. got one question for you. Go ahead. Go ahead, with buddy. The Patriots bring, with the Patriots bringing in Stephon Gilmore and retaining the whole defense, did you see them being the best secondary in the NFL? Potentially. Potentially. With, with Gilmore and Malcolm Butler and chunging yeah, those boys yeah. in the, at the safety spot, I definitely think it's possible. I definitely think it's possible. Then when you've got Tom Brady moving the chains, keeping them rested and off the field as well, even though I think the loss of Julian Edelman definitely is a, is a, is a huge blow to the Patriots, I still believe they're the best team in football. And they're the team to beat. Because think about this. They're the Super Bowl champions. Who had an offseason like them, Marcus? That's what I wanted to ask you. Uh, in your years of watching football, have you ever seen a Super Bowl winning team never. get better the next year? I've not, No, it's not It's not even about better. It's how dominant they were in free agency. I mean, listen, man, I I, I just look at them to get Brandon Cooks and to get uh, Stephon Gilmore. I mean, that's sensational work. That's sensational work. Replacing Martellus Bennett, getting Rob Gronkowski back off an of injury, okay? I, I, I just look at them, you know, hey, I, I got to give credit where credit is due, man. And I just view the Patriots as being that formidable. I truly do, Marcus. So you see them get another ring? Possibly they're the favorites. Just they're, they're the favorites. They're the favorites. I don't see anybody in the AFC beating the Patriots. I do think Atlanta might have a shot to beat them if they face them again. I do believe that. I believe Seattle would probably beat them if they face them again. That's it. Not sure. Not Green Bay because of their defense. Not uh, uh, the uh, you know. Not not Dallas. Maybe the Giants because of their passing attack and their defense and their history. But that's just the way I look at it. That's just me. Got to get on out of here. But I'll be back on the airwaves twenty two hours from now. So hope to hear from you then. You'll definitely hear from me then. It's Stephen A. signing off. Until tomorrow, peace and love. That's just a sample of what you'll hear on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Channel 80 and the ESPN app. 
check out ESPN Films' newly released 30 for 30 podcasts. From the producers of our award-winning documentary series, this is an amazing collection of sports stories you need to hear to believe. Speaking of amazing, Delta Airlines and the Fly Delta app make your travel experience amazingly easy with real-time bag tracking, e-boarding, and passport scanning during check-in. And don't forget to download 30 for 30 podcasts to fill your flight with stories that will keep you coming back for more. This this is the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. I'm Stephen A. Floyd Mayweather would have been embarrassed into infamy. You can slice it any way you want to. This guy, it, it, he had absolutely nothing to gain but money and everything, and I do mean everything to lose. And the fact that Floyd Money Mayweather ended up handling his business in the fashion that he did, everybody's in a better position because of it. You can slice it any way you want to. This is what this comes down to. Floyd Money Mayweather going up against Conor McGregor. Conor McGregor did not put forth a bad performance. I had him winning the first two rounds. Some people had him winning the first three rounds. Some people had him winning the first four rounds. I had him winning the first two. He caught Floyd Mayweather with a nice uppercut, hit him with a few shots. It says he landed more than 100 point, 100 shots. That's not true. He was pity patting Floyd for most of the fight, wasn't using a jab. Didn't show extraordinary boxing ability, but you give credit where credit is due. He did end up surviving about 10 rounds. He got slaughtered in the ninth, got stopped in the 10th, but the first eight rounds, boy, was he lucky that Floyd Mayweather suddenly looked old and didn't look sharp. Because if this man, Floyd Money Mayweather, had been sharp, if he had been a Floyd Money Mayweather that we have come to know, He would have took Conor McGregor out much, much, much earlier. Give Conor McGregor credit because he did not look awful. He actually held his own. Again, he won at least the first two rounds, in my estimation, arguably the first three or four. You got to give credit where credit is due. Floyd had a hard time catching him. Floyd had a hard time getting up in him. He marched straight ahead like he said he would. And as a result, what happened is, is that, guess what? The plan, whether it was a plan B, plan A, whatever the case may be, it worked to perfection. Floyd's strategy was clear. I don't think you can punch as hard in this sport as you appear to punch in the UFC. That's A. B, I'm going to stick my chest, I'm going to stick my face and my head in your chest. I'm going to stalk you. I'm going to crowd you, and I'm going to walk you down. Why am I going to do this? Because, Conor McGregor, I don't believe that you have the stamina to last this entire fight. I don't think you can stay up for this long. Your legs will eventually give out. The fatigue will eventually kick in. And what I do on a regular basis, as it pertains to going 12 rounds, you've got no shot in hell of pulling off in this sport. And Floyd was right. Conor McGregor looked completely gassed. I had him gassed after the fourth round. He was breathing heavy, looked exhausted. And then when Floyd kept hitting him in the body, that seemed to take its toll. And I looked at Conor McGregor as being ill-equipped to do anything about it. Now, I want to show respect and deference to Conor McGregor from the standpoint that fighting in his first professional boxing match against arguably... Well, undisputably, one of the greatest ever. He deserves a lot of credit for that. A lot of credit for that. Because if Conor, but, but let's be clear about something. If Conor McGregor was going up against Canelo Alvarez, if he was going to get up against Triple G, if he was going up against Errol Spence Jr., Conor McGregor would have gotten knocked out inside of three or four rounds. Keith Thurman, throw him into, into the equation as well. Keith Thurman, Danny Garcia, who was at the fight, a Terrence Crawford, guys like that. Had he been going against them? Conor McGregor would have gotten knocked out inside of three or four rounds. I don't care what anybody says. He wouldn't have lasted. There's no way he would have lasted. There's no way he could have lasted. I don't care. You can slice it any way you want to. It wouldn't have happened. But he ended up doing what he needed to do. 
And he deserves a lot of credit for that. And in the end, what it comes down to is that you have to give respect where respect is due. Fighting his first professional fight against one of the best ever, he made a good showing for himself. But he couldn't deal with Floyd Money Mayweather when it really, really counted. Conor McGregor had to come down to 153. That might have taken its toll. Floyd Mayweather was a pristine 149 and a half pounds. For the fight, Conor McGregor came in about 15 pounds more than Floyd Money Mayweather. Didn't matter. As Mayweather said during Friday's weigh-in, weight don't win fights. That's what he said. And that is where we are. He handled his business. He didn't embarrass the sport by losing to a complete novice who never should have been allowed to be in the ring with them to begin with. And as a result, he can walk into retirement. And make no mistake about it, Floyd Money Mayweather needs to go into retirement. The Floyd Money Mayweather that you saw Friday night, I'm not talking about he would afford him, he would afford him the same way or anything like that. I'm just talking plainly and purely how he looked for Saturday night against Conor McGregor. Floyd would have got knocked out by Canelo Alvarez. And Errol Spence Jr. might have beaten him. Or Terrence Crawford might have beaten him. That Floyd Mayweather that was missing those punches, missing one right after another against Conor McGregor, I don't know what he would have done against those other guys. He's always had problems with Southpaws too, which Errol Spence is. So that would have been problematic for him, no question about it. But in the end, what it comes down to is that he did enough. By the way, I'm not counting at 50 and 0. I'm not giving him that. Everybody says, come on, Stephen A. Just have Michael Thompson tell me that. Come on, Stephen A. Get over it. Mad respect for Floyd and what he accomplished. One of the greatest to ever do it. No doubt. But I want to be very clear about where I stand. You do not get to go into the ring against someone who never, ever, ever fought professionally as a boxer before when you're a champion. And that gets to count on your record, not in my eyes. Because champions don't waste their time with anybody who hasn't earned the right to face them in the ring. Conor McGregor earned the right to face Floyd Money Mayweather because he's a star in the UFC and because he's a marketing whiz. He earned every penny. And for an exhibition, you're damn right. They all des- they both deserve their money. They entertained us. I enjoyed myself far more than I thought I would, as well as many others. We didn't get cheated this time. No question. But that doesn't mean you deserve to be 50-0. and 0. That doesn't mean that that deserves to count as win number 50 as a boxer on a championship resume of a Floyd Money Mayweather. I'm sorry. I'm just not flowing with that. I'm just not. 866-729-ESPN is the number to call up. That's 866-729-3776. We'll talk about the fight. We'll talk about whether you count as 50 and 0. We'll talk about where McGregor should go from here. I don't think he should fight anymore. We'll also talk about Colin Kaepernick because of the great Jim Brown and what he had to say about Kaepernick and what you feel about that. All of that and more, plus some football news with Edelman being out. What's that going to mean to the Patriots? And some stuff that took place in the National Football League over the last over this past weekend as well. Lots of stuff to get into, and we will definitely do that right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio. Want to be a part of this show? It's Stephen A. Up weekdays from 1 to 3 Eastern at 866-729-3776. Okay, keep your eyes closed. Okay. I want to show you my first ever painting. Mm, All right. Okay. Open your eyes. Oh, that's a lot of colors Mm -hmm. (laughs) and shapes. So be honest. What do you think? Well, uh, I like how if you switch to Geico, you could save hundreds of dollars on car insurance. Oh, yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah. Here, why don't I hold your paintbrush while you call them? Geico, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio, Sirius XM, Channel 80. Let's get to the phones at 866-729-ESPN. That's 866-729-3776. I'm going to go to my next guest, and I'm going to tell him, I'm only going to call him by this name one time. He, I don't give a damn whether this is a given name or not. He better come up with a nickname or something. Because what I'm about to call this dude is the equivalent of what Cedric the Entertainer said during Kings of Comedy when he said he ain't calling no grown damn man delicious. 
This guy's going to tell me his name is my love from New Jersey. That is the only time I will say that to a grown man. I'm telling you right now, I'm not doing it again. What's up? Speak up. I, I, I respect that, Stephen A. Smith. Um, be, before I made my comment on the fight, I didn't know you had some good dance moves. I'm all right, man. I'm no dance. I just got a little rhythm. That's all. Go ahead. All right. Um, you better have a nickname n- next time you call up here. I'm telling you, I'm not going to let you on the line with that name again. Go ahead. All right. I'll I, I come up with one. Um, on, in, in the ninth round, do you think the referee um, got, got in the way a little bit? Because with McGregor got him in the corner, you think they said that was a low blow. What, what's your take on that? Well, you got to remember, even I thought it was a low blow, but even though it was a low blow and he was going after Floyd, Floyd did what he was doing throughout the fight. He covered up. And when he covered up, I mean, it, it wasn't like, you know, he had him staggered to the point where he was defenseless. Floyd had been covering up and coming right at him while covering up the whole fight. So that didn't make a difference to me. No, I didn't think Conor McGregor had him in trouble. All right, thanks. Take it easy. Wendell. In Los Angeles, you're live with Stephen A. on the ESPN hey, Radio. What's Stephen up? A. First of all, let me uh, – uh, prayers to all the people in the Gulf Coast, you know, for Absolutely. what they're enduring right especially, now. Especially especially and, Houston uh, right now. Houston, Texas got it worse, right? Yeah. And, yeah, and, and then uh, right now. getting to the Mayweather, uh, you, you used the right word. It was an exhibition. That's all it was, was an exhibition. And it was basically a thing where – for Mayweather, in the form of public opinion, he could not win because he did what he was supposed to do. He did exactly what he was supposed to do. And for McGregor, there were no losers. He got defeated. But when they, those checks cleared, they all won. They all they all won. So, I mean, it is well, listen, what it is. I but, hate when we bring that far. up. I mean, that, that that's like saying the sky is blue. I mean, the fact of the matter is if you get a minimum of $100 million, which is what McGregor's going to get, and Floyd tells me he's going to get over $350 million, of course they won. But that's not why you call up to wait online, to wait to come on the air, because, oh, they all won. We all know that. Talk to me about something with the fight. You said something about that the, 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 the Nevada Boxing Commission, that fight was sanctioned by the commission. Yes. So it should stand in, in the records. I disagree. You Go know? ahead. Okay, and also now getting to Jim Brown about the desecration of the anthem, I, I see fans in the stand do more desecration of the national anthem by digging in there wherever, scratching and talking during the, the, the national anthem than okay. Colin Kaepernick would ever do. Well, that's what but he's talking about Colin Kaepernick. He's not talking about the fans. I, I understand. I fully understand that. But I mean, he, I mean, but I don't, I don't, I don't call it desecration myself either. I, I agree with you on that. No, no, I don't think. I don't think he did. I think that Jim Brown's got it all mixed up. And for those who don't know what you're talking about, Jim Brown and I'll read the quote to you when we come out of break. But Jim Brown essentially uh, said that he would never desecrate the flag and he would never, you know, disrespect our nation. I'll quote him accurately when I get the exact quote to put in front of me. But he was talking about how Colin Kaepernick needed to do something different. He needs to decide whether or not he wants to be an activist or a foot football player, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. My position with Jim Brown on this particular issue is I don't agree with him because I don't, I don't believe that Colin Kaepernick desecrated the flag uh, any more than I agree that I believe rather that he insulted our American soldiers, our servicemen and women who's represented our nation. He took a position of speaking out against racial inequality and prejudice along with brutality on the part of police officers. And he was challenging America to live up to what it says it is as a gorgeous mosaic that is the United States of America. My issue with Colin Kaepernick is that he announced to the world that he didn't vote. It's not that he kneeled for the national anthem. So when Jim Brown and them says that he desecrated the flag, I completely disagree with that notion. I think it's wrong and I think it's unfair to Colin Kaepernick. If you have to have a problem with Colin Kaepernick, have a problem with the fact that he doesn't vote. That's what you have a problem with, particularly if you're Jim Brown. But that's me. Voting Rights Act after only a little over 50 years. Well, first of all, you were trying to talk while I was talking. So when you came back on the line, nobody heard the point that you said. All we heard was Voting Rights Act. What did you say before Voting Rights Act? Well, like like I said, you know, uh, you, you made a good point about Kaepernick not voting because we're in the midst of people trying to rescind the Voting Rights Act. Right. Of 1965, and Good it's only, only 52 years. Good point. 
You know, good point. You know, Either people so. don't realize that in this country they can still confiscate the right to vote because the right to vote has been extended to us, if I remember correctly, for like a, a 25 to 50 years. You understand what I'm saying? It's not like it's something that's a matter of law that goes into perpetuity, that it's everlasting. That's not the case. There are still issues as it pertains to the Voting Rights Act that exists within the United States of America. People don't realize that. So your point is very, very valid, Wendell. Hey, man, very valid. Keep, enjoy your show. Keep doing what you're Thank doing. You. Let's embrace diversity, man. Appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. Let's go to Jordan. You're live with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. What's up, Jordan? Hey, what's going on, Stephen? How you doing, brother? Talk to me. So, uh, I am, because I knew I was going to try to talk to you today, I didn't like the fight from start to finish. It was a great fight, man. Um, what I what I took from the fight is Floyd wanted to teach him a lesson and make him go to distance. So he gave him those three rounds because that's what he is. But then I took account of what Roy Jones said on first take on Friday. He's never heard of six, seven, eight, nine. So as I'm sitting there talking to my friend, because everybody, because I work at a bar, and everybody was going for McGregor, and me and a few other people going for Floyd because we know that's Floyd's sport. Floyd's one of my favorites. So everybody's cheering, and they see he's throwing punches. But what people not noticing that he's not hit, he's not landing those punches. When he the face, the boy had a he was he was dodging them, and then his, his counter punches was not it was getting uh, attached to uh, McGregor. McGregor fought a really really good fight. It was a really really good fight. But I seen how he was winning. I said, yo, he's tired. And Floyd kept his uh, defense up really really good. And McGregor, I felt wasn't defending himself as a boxer, but defending himself as an MMA fighter. Hands down, majority of the time, not keeping his hands up close, was getting good shots in on Floyd at times. But when Floyd had got him in that eighth, ninth, and tenth, that you know, after that tenth round, he started rocking him. I thought he's finished, and he kept rocking him. You can see, you can see there was a fatigue on him. He was really retired. He was winded. It was nothing he could do uh, at that point in the tenth round. So Floyd said, and you see Floyd was going at him. So you see Floyd was stalking him at times, letting him get his shots in, letting him tire himself out, and he said, okay, well, let's just see later on rounds, I'm going to go after him. And that's what he did, and he could fall a really, really good fight. So what did you take from what he was – what did you analyze what he was doing from – Well, listen, six, I, thought that seven, Floyd, eight, I thought that Floyd was picking him apart. He warmed down. He knew he had him on the ropes because he knew that Conor McGregor wasn't going to last and he was going to take him out in the later rounds. That was predictable. We could see it. We could see that it was working effectively because Conor was practically out of it, particularly in the ninth round. He got saved. One time he held on to the ropes to prevent himself from falling. My point is, is that Conor McGregor's head was there to be hit throughout the fight he wasn't moving his head at all he would lean back uh to try to avoid punches but he wasn't dodging anything and against a younger sharper opponent he would have gotten annihilated he's a ufc fighter and i think that one of the things we learned is that even though ufc fighters are tough as hell and they deserve profound respect and they're legit fighters because they can beat you a multitude of ways there is an art and a science to boxing and floyd money Mayweather showed and proved that on Saturday night, which is why neither of the sports should be disrespected. We respect what it is. We understand what it, where it comes from. But in the end, there are levels to this. And, and Conor McGregor, as a boxer, just couldn't really compete with Floyd Money Mayweather as far as I'm concerned. He doesn't need to be back in boxing at all. He needs to go back to the UFC and stay there because if he gets in a boxing ring with somebody younger and sharper, I think he's going to get destroyed. Yeah, a couple of small more things. Uh, one more thing about the fight, man. A shout out to Houston. My mom was down there. Um, I can see when he was tying up with them, you can tell he was very uneducated on how to protect himself in a tie up. He was bopping him on the head uh, on, on top of the head. Referee had to back him up many a time. He had to keep warning him to stop doing that because he was not educated on how you use a tie up. He was using the tie up as I don't know what he was doing. It was makeshift the moves and what he was throwing in there. And, right. uh, you know, uh, he had him tied up at one point. And uh, he uh, I got it. away. And Floyd was trying to get out of it. And he's yep. like, okay. And then it kept in the support. Yeah, you you, you dissecting really- it a little you you dissecting it a little bit too much, bro, and far more experts, far more knowledgeable and in depth and close to it than you have already broken it down for radio purposes. I don't need you to do that. I got it. But in the end, what it comes down to is that Floyd should retire and Conor McGregor should go back to the UFC. It's just that simple. It was an exhibition. It was nothing more. This is not a fifty and zero elite boxing match that Floyd Mayweather ultimately registered. I'm sorry, I'm not giving him 
that. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! Oh, 33 minutes past hour number one back here on the Stephen A. Smith Show ESPN Radio. That's 98.7 FM New York, 710 ESPN on LA. And of course, nationwide over the airways of ESPN Radio, Sirius XM Channel Lady. Back to the phones we go. Let's go to Chris in LA. You're live with Stephen A. Talk to me. Hey, Stephen A. Good afternoon. Uh, quick thing, man. Did you get a quick question? Did you get a chance to cross paths with your old partner in crime and skip Davis while you were in Vegas? Um, no, I did not. You did not. Okay, so you don't know the prediction that your man Skip had before the fight and what he said after the fight. No, nor do I care. He's at the other network. I'm here. Oh, okay. Oh, I apologize. Okay, I don't just wanted to okay. still, you know, chat. No, we okay, we, okay. we still we, we still we're still boys. We will always be brothers from another mother. That's my man. But he does him. Right. I do me. All right, understandable, understandable. So just real quick, I just want to throw out there something he said. Tell me what your take is on this. The man Skip says that Floyd, for a long time, he was being outboxed by Conor McGregor, and he was in trouble early in the ninth round. What is your take when Skip says that? Uh, I disagree. Totally. I disagree 1,000. <laughs> <laughs> what else is it was new? Go ahead. Me. I just thought maybe you knew already, but you didn't. no. no. <laughs> No, I don't pay attention to that. I, I'm more focused on what my man Max Kellerman says. He's my partner in crime now, not Skip Bayless. So I'm, I'm I'm more focused on what he says and what he brings to the table. First take, we're doing our thing. We will continue to do our thing. I wish nothing but the best for my buddy who will always be my brother. Uh, but he's doing him, and I'm doing me. Okay, absolutely. I apologize. I wasn't trying to get into all that. I just thought it was funny because I remember you must joke around with the whole Mountain Dew with it being spiked yeah. and all that with Skip. That's the yeah. first thing that came to mind when I watched him this morning on Undisputed. I'm yep. like, man, Stephen A. might you. be right. He might be spiked this morning. <laughs> I got it. Might be spiked. I appreciate it, man. Thanks for the call. Let's go to Jay. You're live with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. What's up, man? Hey, how's it going, Stephen A.? I'm all right. Love the show. I got a couple of quick points now. The, uh, I really think Mayweather took it easy on it, you know, because he could have used his normal fighting style, and um, the, the guy wouldn't have touched him. You know, they saying he hit him a hundred and some times, but. And they saying that oh, that's more than Pacquiao. Well, you they, know, they, they, they're, they're, count, they're counting the times that Conor McGregor led with his right and just and just tapped down Floyd's gloves. That's what they're counting as hits, evidently, because he damn sure didn't hit Floyd a hundred times. That I can okay, tell. Okay, well, well, well let, let me say this then. Well, what do you think about if he would have used his normal fighting style? Well, we know it's born the shoulder roll where he have his head kind of back and all that. Would, would he even got those many punches? Or, or would it have? Probably maybe ended sooner or would have went longer. I, still I think, think Floyd I think Floyd. Good. I think I think no, he did not look good at all, sir. Not at all. Not compared to what we were accustomed to seeing Floyd look like. Floyd is very very smart. He's getting out the game at the right time because the way he looked Saturday night, he would not have beaten any of these young boxers. I'm telling you that right now. Uh, he was missing. I mean, he Conor McGregor would have been out four rounds earlier if Floyd Mayweather were connecting on half those punches. Yeah. He'd have been out yeah. four rounds well, earlier. Well, I, uh, another thing I'll just say, I think he, I, that's why I really think he did it for the fans. So he came at him. You know, he was, like you said, he was almost stalking him, walking around the ring following him. But um, last little point I wanted to make was uh, McGregor. Do you think he would go back to the UFC and fight again? He's because definitely going to go back. So he de- he, no, he definitely is going to go back. He announced that he would be going back. But I will say this. I don't think the question about McGregor is whether or not he'll go back to the UFC. I think the question about him is whether or not you believe he's going to be as good. Because where's the urgency now? Yeah, he was getting three to five million dollars. About three million dollars was his largest payday. He's going to make a minimum of thirty million for this fight. Oh, he made a minimum of thirty million for this fight. And when you take into account pay per view sales, Conor McGregor is going to make over a hundred million dollars for this one fight. I mean, just think about that for a second there. So when I look at it from that perspective, it come, what comes to my mind and what it makes me say is, you know what? Wow. I got to look at it for what it is and and just say, is he going to be as hungry? That's the question. Because in a pugilistic sport, man, when you got these guys that are coming from rags in pursuit of riches, uh, they're willing to do anything. They're willing to put themselves through anything just to get to that point. And the worst thing that could happen to them is comfortability and affluence. When you live that kind of life and you've got something to lose, your heart usually leaves because it's just not worth it. Mayweather was an exception. Connor might be an exception along with a few others throughout history. But for the most part, those who capture affluence and riches and wealth and have something to lose, 
it usually reflects in their performances because they're not going to go all out because they don't have to any longer. Their primary obligation is to depart healthy as opposed to winning. And I think that's the difference. Okay. Well, at, at $3 million a fight, that's like 30 fights to make a hundred million, you know? So yeah, I can't, I can't see him being hungry, you know, or, or whatever, no more to, to even want to go and get beat like that. For three million dollars, you know that's so fair. That's but you know, Floyd. Say, but you know, Floyd has fought. Floyd has fought for many years, despite having made hundreds of millions of dollars. It didn't stop him from going into the ring and handling his business. So maybe that'll be the same for Connor. Okay. Well, thanks, man. Love the show. Keep doing what you're doing. Uh, you're the only reason next year I'm getting my money. Thanks Appreciate a lot, bro. You. Appreciate you, man. Let's go to Ryan in Ohio. You're live with Stephen A. Talk to me, Ryan. What's up? What's up, Steve? Going on, bro. You live on the air. Go ahead. Hey, man. Big big shout out to you, man. Hey, I got a couple things I just want to talk about real quick. You know, being here in Ohio, man, we're about like uh, thirty minutes north of Cincinnati. So I got I got to ask you about Vontez. But first, let's get on the fight. Uh, I, I did watch the fight round for round, man. I think it was a good fight on on behalf of uh, McGregor. Uh, I think a lot of people thought McGregor might uh, wild out and wasn't going to be able to take the pressure and, and might you know resort to a kick or a takedown or something, and I got to give him his credit, man. He did stand up. He went straight from the shoulders, man. It was I didn't see him do really do anything illegal, like you said before, with another caller. He did get tired. I saw him grab the ropes like he was trying to keep himself up. All right, man. But- listen, listen, bro, I got to interrupt you because your, your, point, your point is well made. But if you're going to get to a second point, you need to do it now because you're taking too long. Go ahead. What's your second? All right, my bad. Let's let's get with Vontez, man. Uh, Devontae's hit. I think the five game suspension is too is too much, man. I don't. I, I looked at the hit. Uh, I played football in high school, man. You got five yards to touch the receiver. He he, he was within that five yards, man. I mean, you got to keep your head on the swivel going across the middle with the line. Doesn't right, matter. Steve. Doesn't matter. You know why? And you know, and I got you right here, Ryan. You're totally wrong, and you're gonna agree with me. You know why? Because the NFL has warned him time and time again, and they've implemented rules and regulations, and it's not the way football used to be because of their because of their focused on safety. Every off season, some new rule is implemented, and not only do they go team to team to talk about it, they emphasize talking to Vontez Perfect, who's received over eight hundred thousand dollars in fines in his career, and you still go out and do it. Now, we ain't talking about you, Ryan. We ain't talking about you, you know, because you might know better. And even though you might feel like the rules are the rules and you got to keep your head on a swivel and football is football, if $800,000 was taken out of your pocket and you knew the next transgression could cost you just as much due to one more penalty, how much you want to make a bet, Ryan, you'd fly straight even though you didn't like the rule? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you, man. I just, and, again, that, and I just, that's the point. That that, but see, that's the biggest point. I'm not saying what I'm saying to you is you're right in theory in what you're saying, Ryan. Just don't use Vontez Perfect to make that case because that man continues to put himself in these positions. That's the problem. They didn't throw a flag on that play, though. You know. It don't matter. It don't matter because yeah, listen, you got to remember. There's plenty of times he's been penalized where flags weren't thrown. There's plenty of times where they came back to him after watching the footage and saying, this is what you did. He had to go up to the league office and them talk to him one-on-one face-to-face because of it. How do you not know? And then you're going to put yourself in a position where you strip yourself of over $800,000 out of your pocket just to hit a defenseless running back? Why would you do that, Ryan? Why? Let him go. Let him go. Keep your money. What are you doing? They're throwing a bomb, Ryan. They're throwing the football 30 yards downfield. And just because you see this guy not looking at you, you want to hit him? Why? For what? Why? It's part of the play, though. uh, I just told you, Ryan, would you do it? If you knew that the next penalty was going to cost you $800,000 in five games, would you do it, yes or no? I got to say no. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Give Stephen A. a piece of your mind. He is sorry. Call him weekdays from 1 to 3 Eastern. I mean, just trash. At 866-729-3776. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it. Phones we go. Back here on the Stephen A. Smith Show. 
ESPN Radio. Going to get more into Colin Kaepernick and Jim Brown in hour number two. Some stuff about the New England Patriots and Edelman going down. Some NFL action that I saw over the weekend. And, of course, uh, the Cavs-Celtics trade that potentially has gone awry. A lot of stuff is going into it. Um, And also, I'm going to play my final take for you from today's show on the first take, ESPN. Um, I'm going to play that for you because it's something that I wanted to say about Floyd Money Mayweather that should be appreciated more than people realize. I'll play that, replay that final take for you in hour number two. But until then, let's get back to the phones. My brother, Mike in Denver, how you doing, my man? Good to hear from you. What's up? I'm doing fine. How you doing, Stephen? I'm good, man. Talk to me. What's going on? I was just uh, calling about the fight, man. I really enjoyed it. It was a good fight, better than what I thought it was. But yep. one thing that um, I want to point out is Floyd told you, just like he told everybody in an interview, I'm, I got to go get him. He Remember did. He, told you that? he, he, he did. He I, I give him credit, too, because everybody was raving about the power that Conor McGregor packed in his punch. And they were supposed to go in there with 10 ounce gloves. And then Connor wanted it down to eight, and Floyd agreed, and they got the Nevada State Athletic Commission uh, to, you know, capitulate. You're usually not supposed to fight with less than ten ounce gloves at 154 pounds or above, and they got them to reduce it to eight ounce gloves. And you know, uh, evidently, it, it it obviously worked out. It obviously like did. Said, if if anybody was paying attention, because you even looked at him when he said it, he said, "Nah, I got to go get him." Yeah. Yeah, and I didn't and believe it. I didn't believe it. But thought he, it was a ploy. Yeah, everybody he thought it was a right decoy. Towards, he walked right. He walked right up to him. The, practically the entire fight. That With was the, the reason why they talking about the hundred eleven punches. But that was the, the, the hit on the arms and all that. That's you know, right. Floyd would have fought his normal fight. He would never touch him. But Floyd showed a lot of courage, man, when he took that shot from him and went back to the corner and said, "Man, I got him now." You know what I mean? So I really enjoyed it, man. I really enjoy your show, but I'm, I'm going to let you get back to the other callers, man, because, you, you know, I'm always like to hear you, man. Get on down. <laughs> I love you, man, and I, I'm listening. I appreciate it. I appreciate it, man, to give your brother my love. Let's go to Mike in L.A. You're live with Stephen A. Talk to me, Mike. What's up? Yes, sir. Thank you, man. I want to talk about that appreciation. I've appreciated Connor's rise to fame, his his talents. I, I, what I'm wondering about today is is his corner, John Cavanaugh, win or learn, I think or is is a trouble here. Win and learn. Uh, Connor won those early rounds. I'm not sure that they were paying attention. I don't know. Uh, I just wonder what, what do you, you think what, about. What, what, their, are you, what are you trying to say? What are you trying to say? I don't understand. Maybe they didn't make an adjustment they needed to make. I mean, Floyd didn't throw, but what one punch in the first round, three or four in the second round. You got to recognize that you're getting led into deep waters. All I heard from their corner was uh, full recovery, full recovery. They got ice bags on Connor's chest, on his back. You look in Floyd's corner. He hasn't taken a deep breath in 15 minutes. No, no, no. I realized that, and that was a strategy on the part of Floyd. What I'm saying to you is this. How do you – I mean, that doesn't take away from the fact that Mayweather lost those first two rounds. He no, was no. strategizing, but he still lost them. That's right, and I'm wondering if they didn't recognize they were getting pulled out to deep water and, and take a look at their strategy and say, hey, look, Connor's hitting them, but it doesn't look like it's imparting any damage. Do we want to take a really, really bold move, use this information we're getting, and kind of ride this out into six, seven, eight, nine with a little more energy? I mean, they, they spent their load. Everybody seems to agree on that. I just wonder if there was any discussion on, you know what, let's put the pressure on him to come at us. He's got a big ego. He's promised he's going to take the fight to us. He's not doing it. So what are we going to do with that information? Maybe it's overconfidence on their part. Maybe they thought Connor was going to get at him uh, and it was going to work. Uh, I didn't see that, and I'm a, I'm a Connor appreciator. I just didn't see it, and I, I'm wondering why they didn't see that or if they were just dead set on their plan. I don't know. Well, listen, listen. I, I think that Connor, they were dead set on their plan. And like, like Connor said, he was very, very honest. He said, look, the guy came right at me and put his head in my chest. And he said, I didn't expect that. He didn't see that coming. He assumed that Floyd Money Mayweather would try to counter, that he'd be on the outside looking at how to get in. He didn't think that Floyd would walk right to him the way that he did and keep him backing up, keep him moving because you don't just stand there. Okay. And, 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 and try, you're not a Conor McGregor. You're not trying to fight on the inside like that. That's not where Conor McGregor's strength lies. And as a result, I think that's what shocked him. Uh, uh, Mike, that's what I think got him. 
I think you're right too. I appreciate your insight. I think I'll add one more thing, and I really and I like Connor for this too. He said he, what he didn't under what he didn't realize is that he was going to spend so much energy, and the result was going to be he was going to have Floyd's back, and that was very telling. He's got Floyd's back, and in an MMA fight, he's going to know what to do from there. But he spent all this energy getting at Floyd, and Floyd, for whatever reason, I, don't, I haven't seen all his fights, but he gave him that back, and it's like, and even I think it was Jim Lampley got all fired up at one point in the fight, saying that's illegal, that's illegal. It, was, it, was, it wasn't it was Jim Lampley, but I get what you're saying, and I understand. I appreciate the call. Thank you so much. Listen, the bottom line is Floyd threw him off because Floyd was doing things he hadn't seen before, watching tape, watching Floyd. He didn't know. He didn't know. Got completely thrown off. But again, that's Floyd, the computer, the magician in the ring, executing yet again. That's just a sample of what you'll hear on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Channel 80 and the ESPN app. Check out ESPN Films' newly released 30 for 30 podcasts. From the producers of our award-winning documentary series, this is an amazing collection of sports stories you need to hear to believe. Speaking of amazing, Delta Airlines and the Fly Delta app make your travel experience amazingly easy with real-time bag tracking, e-boarding, and passport scanning during check-in. And don't forget to download 30 for 30 podcasts to fill your flight with stories that will keep you coming back for more. This this is the Stephen A. Smith Show Podcast. I'm Stephen A. Stephen A. Smith Show here with you. For the next hour or so over the airwaves of ESPN Radio, Sirius XM, Channel 80. Number to call up as always, 866-729-ESPN. It's 866-729-3776. Oh, man, watching the news. Um, our hearts go out to all the folks in Houston. Massive flooding that's taking place. Hurricane Harvey. Um, flooding right now. I mean, what do you say? What do you say? Right now, you got to look at things for what they are and just hope and pray that everybody's okay. City of Houston is just uh, essentially drowning right now. I will say that um, hats off to J.J. Watt. You know, there's a reason why he can have a celebrity softball game and 30,000 people show up. You know why, ladies and gentlemen? Because his heart's always in the right place. Um, concerned about the city of Houston and the folks out there who are suffering. Uh, he's looking at things for what it is and, 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 and doing his part uh, to help folks in need. Um, talks about the strength, the intestinal fortitude that will be required to uplift the city of Houston and beyond. Uh, that's why J.J. Watt's a special guy. And um, we just wish him nothing but the best. And, you know, obviously uh, folks here at ESPN, other networks as well and an individual throughout the sports world. I'm quite sure everybody will be willing to do whatever it can uh, to help these folks. This disaster that has been taking place in Texas. Uh, I don't think anybody will hesitate. Anybody with a heart would hesitate. I know I wouldn't. Uh, so our hearts go out to all of those people there. Um, it's certainly something that we should be cognizant of. And, um, you know, our prayers are with the folks in the city of Houston and beyond that throughout that area uh, that are struggling right now due to the inclement weather conditions and this, uh, uh, the catastrophe that is taking place from a weather perspective, obviously that's what I'm talking about here. And um, we'll just keep them in our prayers and hope that things get considerably better. That's what we will do. Uh, a couple of other things to move on from. Um, speaking of uh, an NFL player like JJ Watt, let's transition to uh, Julian Edelman. He got hurt apparently reportedly torn ACL. He's going to be out. Listen, New England Patriots got Brandon cooks in the off season from the saints. They still got this guy, Chris Hogan. Malcolm Mitchell had a breakout year last season. You still got Denny Amendola. Um, you, you got Gronk coming back. Hopefully he's ready to go. When you look at the New England Patriots, make no mistake about it, they're loaded. I mean, to be a Super Bowl champion and have the kind of offseason that they had speaks volumes about who they are as an organization and what they bring to the table. Cannot be ignored. And I'm just of the mindset to sit here and let you know right here, right now, that despite all of that, don't think for one second that the loss of Julian Edelman won't hurt. Tom Brady spoke about it, alluding to the issue of trust. And when you look at the issue of trust, you got Julian Edelman there, man. This is Tom Brady's most reliable weapon. 
Don't think for one second that losing Julian Edelman doesn't hurt the New England Patriots. It does, without question, absolutely. Don't you doubt it. 866-729-ESPN is the number to call. It's 866-729-3776. That's just one of the elements that we couldn't ignore. I mean, when you talk about Julian Edelman, you got to look at it this way. 1,106 yards last season. The three previous seasons was one was was 1,056, 972, and 692. Reception-wise, 105, 92, 61, and then 98 last year. I don't care what anybody say. Losing Julian Edelman is a loss. You can slice it any way you want. Losing him is a loss. I don't care how loaded they are. Another football player I want to get into, can't help but get into, is Colin Kaepernick. He was in the news again, this time because of Jim Brown, who says, I don't desecrate my flag. That's what Jim Brown said. He goes on. He says, Colin has to make up his mind whether he's truly an activist or he's a football player. If you're trying to be both, football is commercial. You have owners, you have fans, and you want to honor that if you're making that kind of money. That's what he said. He also went on to say, I'm going to give you the real deal. I'm an American. I don't desecrate my flag and my national anthem. I'm not going to do anything against the flag and national anthem. I'm going to work within those situations. But this is my country, and I'll work out the problems, but I'll do it in an intelligent manner. If you have a cause, I think you should organize it, present it in a manner whether it's not on, where it's not only you standing or sitting on one knee, but a lot of people that are going to get behind each other and do something about it. I ask you one question. Who is Colin calling on to follow what he's talking about. That's what Jim Brown had to say. My response is the same as it was in hour number one. I think Jim Brown is wrong in terms of alluding to desecrating the flag. Colin Kaepernick was not desecrating the flag. Colin Kaepernick took a position. He went down on one knee, exercising his individual and constitutional rights under the United States of America as a citizen. His protest was peaceful. It did not inhibit anybody from watching the game of football or playing the game of football or coming to witness watching the game of football being played. It did none of those things. He took an individual position of kneeling during the national anthem because he wanted to bring attention to racial injustice and prejudice and inequality along with brutality on the part of some police officers. That's what Colin Kaepernick was doing. He was not desecrating the flag. He was not insulting the men and women who served in our armed forces. He was doing no such thing. He was reminding America of the rights and the privileges under which it stands and saying, you're not living up to it and challenging them to do better. That's what he was doing. That's what he was doing. And if that's what anybody is saying, if that's what anybody is feeling, if that's what anybody is thinking, you're wrong. And that definitely needs to be said. Eight six six seven two nine ESPN. That's eight six six seven two nine three seven seven six. That's what you got to do. You got to be real about that. There's no way around this. It's just the truth. Jim Brown is right though, when he talks about you know having a plan, because too many people want to do things, but. They don't have a plan. When you marched in Selma, that was a plan. When there was a march on Washington, that was a plan. It was organized. The residual impact that followed was predictable because there was a plan in place. You don't get around that. It cannot be ignored. So him saying that is fair because Jim Brown is asking, well, what you going to do? You took a knee, now what? 
And Colin Kaepernick pointing out how charitable and philanthropic he is because he pledged a million dollars to worthy causes. He's living up to that. He's already donated over $800,000, has another $100,000 that he's going to donate to a cause very, very soon. He's to be commended for all of that. But wondering about who he's giving money to for worthy causes ain't the issue. The issue is why he took the knee and whether or not real substantive change has taken place in that regard. Jim Brown is right to ask that question. Desecrating the flag? Not so much. That's not what Colin Kaepernick did. And he shouldn't be accused of that. Catch the Stephen A. Smith Show live on 98.7 ESPN New York, ESPN LA 710, and Sirius XM Channel 80. You just can't make this stuff up. Weekdays from 1 to 3 Eastern. You're listening to Love Advice with Leanne. Caller, you're on the air. Uh, hi, Leanne. Long-time listener, first-time caller. <laughs> Why, in your professional opinion, do you never take my calls off the air? Is this Carl? Yep, it's Carl. I mean, we had a few dates. Everything was great, I thought. Uh... Well, you know, when you switch to GEICO, you could save a lot of money on car insurance. Okay, awesome. You should call them. I will. GEICO, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Patrice, in Brooklyn, you're live with Stephen A. Go ahead. Hello? Hello. Demetrius, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Demetrius is here. Yes. How you ahead. doing? I'm all right. Go ahead. All right. Okay, listen, Um, my comment was about Jim Brown's comments. I mean, back in the 60s, he was one that was fighting. He was fighting for civil rights and civil rights issues. And then for him to come out in 2017 and have something negative to say about Colin Kaepernick, who's done nothing short of stand up as a black man in America playing American sports, we need black men. It's very right there, black stop, right there, stop, stop, stop right there. Watch your tone. And here's why I tell you to watch your tone. Because Jim Brown, just because of what you just said, how he was one of those individuals who fought, he would know what the times were like then compared to what the times are like now. I disagree with him about his specific comments in terms of desecrating the flag because I happen to believe emphatically that that is not what Colin Kaepernick was doing. But when he's making an argument about what you should be doing, if indeed you're trying to be an activist, he is qualified to elaborate extensively on that because he wouldn't know what it requires. So when he says, where's your plan? And did you organize? Demetrius, those are legitimate concerns. Legitimate concerns, but I think he's done more than enough by just accepting his punishment right now. The man stood up. He 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 stood up for something that he felt very deeply. No, 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 no. But that, that, but that, but that's not what that's not what Jim Brown is alluding to, sir. What he's saying, we're not saying that Ka, that Colin Kaepernick is not willing to accept his punishment. What he's saying is that if you were kneeling, why were you kneeling? What was the goal, and where's the end game? We don't ask ourselves that question enough. Jim Brown is right to ask that question. He's not right to say he desecrated the flag or he's not going to desecrate his flag because that's not what Colin Kaepernick was doing. But he is right to ask the question, what's the end game? Now answer that question, Demetrius. What is the end game if you're Colin Kaepernick? And do you believe that has been accomplished? I believe the end game is for more more players to stand up. If the players don't stand up and stand as one, we will never be respected as one in this country. And I think that's what the end game is. I mean, he got a couple of players to. It was a pleasure. Have a good day. I mean, he had a couple of players stand with him. You know, I I, I appreciate and I really appreciate the, the Caucasian players who are actually joining in. But we need everyone to stand up because this is an issue that's not going away. So when you use the word desecrate, that's a strong word. And and certain um, people will latch on to that word. And then now here it is, basically Colin Kaepernick, he's taking some steps forward, but you have a black man making him go 10 steps back. Well, well, see, that's not fair. That's not fair because I don't think, listen, we disagree with Jim Brown. I don't think he's taking so we going to stand 10 steps back. See, that's our problem. I believe that's our problem as a community. The, the fact is Jim Brown, as, a, as an activist himself, believes that Colin Kaepernick didn't have a plan. Yes, he said desecrate the flag. 
I disagree with them. You disagree with them. I think most people would disagree with that statement. Colin Kaepernick's not taking 10 steps back because Jim Brown expressed that opinion. And I think on far too many occasions, we are of this mindset that we have to be monolithic in our thinking. Black folks come in all shapes and si- all shapes and sizes, man. Just because Jim Brown said that doesn't mean we take 10 steps back. We can respectfully disagree with somebody like Jim Brown, who has been an activist on behalf of the black community. You think I agree with him going to Trump and coming out them damn golden elevators? Hell no. That took us more steps back than him saying what he said about Colin Kaepernick. But I don't recall us being 10 steps back. So why do we feel the need to overreact just because we disagree with his position? How can we just can't disagree with his position? Without thinking he takes us 10 steps back, Demetrius. I respect that, Stephen A., 100%. But when is that time going to come as we, as men of color in this country, that we still have a long, long way to go? When can we stand up and provide provide a united front? That's my point. but, 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 But here's my point to you. Who's to say we're not united? Because you might disagree with how Colin Kaepernick did something. You can't disagree with his message. I never once heard Jim Brown say, I disagree Colin Kaepernick's message about racial inequality in this country. I never once heard Jim Brown say, I disagree with him about the issue of brutality on the part of police officers. He might have disagreed with the particular protest. In other words, how you decided to address it, but he didn't disagree with the message. And if he didn't disagree with the message, how are we divided? You you have a strong point. I have to give you that, Stephen A. But also, of one point that you keep on making about the vote, the voting sure. situation, our sure. common vote means nothing in this country. We know I disagree that. We with know you. That the- I disagree with you. You know why I disagree with you? Because let me tell you something right now. Two million less black people showed up to vote for Hillary Clinton that voted up to show to vote for Barack Obama. Had those same people listened to our 44th president, Barack Obama, and, and, and don't boo, vote. And they went out and they had voted. Hillary Clinton, even though she already won the popular vote, had those two million people spread throughout Ohio and Pennsylvania and Michigan and, and, and all of that. Had they gone out to vote? She would have won the Electoral College vote. She'd have been the president of the United States. And we wouldn't be talking about the issues we're talking about. So that's not that's not correct. That is absolutely positively incorrect. And oh, by the way, the Electoral College votes, Demetrius, only is applicable to presidential elections. Don't have nothing to do with the Senate. Don't have nothing to do with congressmen. Don't have anything to do with the gubernatorial races. Don't have anything to do with the mayoral races. Don't have anything to do with the city council, the attorney generals, the prosecutors, the state attorney generals, that is, the prosecutors, et cetera, et cetera. There are many ways in which to impact this country with the vote beyond the presidential election. Stop saying that our votes don't count. They absolutely positively do, and history has proven that. We have to fight. We have to present a united front. That's that's pretty much the, just the bottom line of my you. comments. I understand I, that. You're not wrong about that. You're not wrong about that. But let's be factual in what we're saying and not disincentivize people to do things that clearly are substantive and have the potential to have an impact. Because when we do that, we're being irresponsible and we're crippling our own community because we're ingraining this mentality in the souls of youngsters on a come up that their vote and other things don't count. When that is factually incorrect and incredibly damaging, did it ever occur to you, Demetrius, that that's what people want our communities, the minority communities, communities within this country that's the exact attitude they want folks to take so you'll never go to the polls you'll never provoke an exact change and the people who are insidious with their intent can continue to be that way into perpetuity because they know we ain't gonna go to the polls thank you yes you are so right they'll keep up with the nefarious ways thanks a lot man well nefarious is more wicked than anything else and i'm not wicked just wanted to be on the slip. You know, innocuous is harmless. Nefarious is wicked. Just so you know, not trying to pull out the Webster's dictionary on you or anything. Just being factual. Frank, um, what is that? France and Long Beach? Alive and Stephen A. What's up? Frankie, you get me messing with France and Freddie. It's Frankie from Long Beach. Freddie, anyway, okay. Oh, like it says Frankie. It says Frankie. I'm sorry. It says Frankie. I didn't have my glasses on. It says Frankie. But go ahead. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, you see, I like the last conversation, the last call. That was good, man. You taking me back. You were very sharp, man. And I appreciate that. 
And um, now I'm going to Floyd Mayweather thing, though. Yep. Floyd, man, I think he gave America a gift, man, for his, like, his boxing and his career for his boxing. And when he told America about how McGregor, like, came short in advertising for the fight and promoting the fight, he meant well in a way where he was talking about how McGregor should have promoted his ways in the W uh, UFC where he fight at, like Mayweather was promoting boxing, and it would have been a, bit, a bigger game and a better thing. That's what Mayweather was talking about. And Mayweather did what Ali did, and America didn't recognize it, so I told my homeboy. The first three rounds was a rope dope That's all. Like, Ali had a big fighter with Foreman. You know, this guy weighed Mayweather about maybe 10, 15 pounds. And Mayweather put the rope dope on him, put him around him, punch himself out, and then did what Mayweather do. I'm clear with that, Steve. I appreciate it, man. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! Hey, listen. You know, one of the things that you got to talk about with Floyd is legacy. Wasn't a knockout artist. You know, history with domestic violence. None of this stuff can be escaped. But there's something that hasn't been talked about with him that I think needs to be talked about. And that's why I decided to dedicate my final take today on first take to that very, very subject. Listen in to my final take from today on ESPN on first take on Floyd Money Mayweather. Listen up. Beyond the glitz and glamour, the flossing, the pomp and circumstances surrounding everything that culminated in Saturday night's Mayweather versus McGregor fight, there were a few sightings that were relatively low-key in comparison, but more significant than many may realize. At the weigh-in, there was a two-time NBA champion, Draymond Green, and star guard Paul George. On fight night, of course, there was LeBron James, James Harden, Isaiah Thomas, and a few others. And none of them were there just to pay homage to Mayweather, the fighter. It's the businessman in Mayweather they actually love even more. As the sun clearly set, on the boxing career of Mayweather, many can reflect on a lot of things about the man. He wasn't a Mike Tyson-like knockout artist or even Tommy the Hitman Hearns. To many, he wasn't even Sugar Ray Leonard. He certainly can't be confused with Muhammad Ali or any other fighter who's ever been socially conscious. No doubt he was guilty of domestic violence, as our very own The Undefeated accurately pointed out. He definitely had a share of boring fights that didn't give the people what they actually wanted to see. But that ain't the legacy these athletes are paying attention to. What they're paying attention to instead is the billion dollars plus Mayweather has earned in his career. How box office he made himself. How he's been his own boss, answerable to no commissioner, no owner, no GMs, and barely even the fans for the last decade in achieving unprecedented wealth, fame, and control of his own name, his own brand. And how despite strenuous efforts by so many to bring him down, they simply weren't able to do it. You want to see an athlete drool? The idolized displaying deference and respect? Watch as these athletes marvel at Mayweather. He talks to them, implores them, encourages them, teaches them, knowing that for all the ways in which they understandably want to be nothing like him, they'd give anything to be him right now. They don't care whether you view Mayweather as 49 and 0 or 50 and 0. They don't lament whether McGregor was a real opponent or not. They salivate instead over the reality of Mayweather's greatness as a marketer, how he turned pariah status into billions, how somehow, some way, he got folks to make him rich beyond measure, knowing they hated doing so along the way, yet simply couldn't help themselves. That's where the true champion in Mayweather lies. It's why we should understand if they're saying right now, boy, I wish I could make money like him, even if they're saying it today. And that's what it comes down to, ladies and gentlemen. When you look at these marquee athletes and you look at the advent of social media, why the hell you think LeBron James saddled with over 37 million Twitter followers and Lord knows how many in Instagram and Facebook? Why do you think he sits around and takes a photo of himself at every turn or videos of himself, whatever the case may be? He was in attendance for the fight Saturday night. Why do you think all of these other guys do the same? They desperately want to control their own brand, their own image, their own voice. They don't want to be answerable to anybody. They want independence, not just in terms of wealth, but everything else in between. And Mayweather has it. He doesn't have to answer to anybody. 
That's the dream come true for every American, white, black, or otherwise. Think about it. You wake up every day. Think about it if you woke up today, you didn't have a boss. And I had pretty damn good bosses. But I swear I wish I was my own at all times. Some people are more fortunate than others to pull that off. But there are very, very few in this day and age in this world. Mayweather did it. That's why these players gravitate to him. That's why they listen to him. That's why they go visit him. That's why you see him at games. That's why they talk to him. Because he's done what almost none of them have been able to do. That's why you got to give him credit where credit is due. Plain and simple. Brian in Staten Island, you're live with Stephen A. What's up? Hey, what's going on, Steve? I uh, just want a little comment on the fight. Um, the biggest part I saw in the fight was McGregor would land a punch and then watch his follow-up punch. It was like a little pit of pat I think he was more afraid of the counter punch from Floyd and never got anything going because of it. Could have been the case. Well, you know what that would mean, though, right? That would mean that he was feeling Floyd's punches more than he let on. I, I believe so. I mean, you know, it's – uh. You know, Floyd does have power. He doesn't use it every fight because he's more a defensive fighter and a counter puncher. But uh, when he did catch him, he caught him good. And I think I think he got real cautious very quickly on if he wanted to stay and engage or even land that shot and work his way out. Now, he opted to work his way out more times than not. Got you. Good point. Appreciate the call, buddy. Thank you so much. Let's go to Dre. You're live with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. What's up, Dre? Stephen A., what's going on? Just two quick points. Go ahead, man. Uh, point number one. I told you I'd be giving you a call. I don't know if you remember. On the uh, 27th, I said I'll call you the 27th. Way before everybody jumped on that uh, Mayweather uh, uh, knockout thing, I had uh, predicted. I said he was going to get knocked, TKO, and I didn't predict the round. Didn't think it would go that far. But I told you I'd give you a call on the 27th. But that's the first point. Hold the on, wait a minute. Point you is, said who was going to get knocked out? Conor McGregor. I said Floyd okay. went by knockout. Okay, go ahead. And I said. Okay, the second point. Oh, you really stepped I'm, out on a limb there, but go ahead. No, <laughs> I said T- TKO. Anyhow, I'm a little surprised in you, and I don't agree with you when you kind of not give Floyd as much credit as he deserved when you say, uh, you and others say he's the best defensive boxer of all time. But on one hand, you'll say that. Then you'll say, on the other hand, Kawhi Leonard is the best two-way player. And if I'm not mistaken, boxing is a – Offense, defense, just the same as basketball. To that, you say? I'm not even thinking about that. I don't even know what to say about that. I mean, we're talking about a boxing match, and you bring in a basketball comparison? No. Boxing, you're in the ring by boxing, you're in the ring by yourself. Basketball, you're on the court with four of the with four of the teammates against five of the dudes. You're being coached. There's a system that comes with it. There's so many intangibles that have that have no relatability whatsoever. I don't like that comparison at all. It's offense and defense. You said Kawhi is the best two-way player, but yet Mayweather is playing a, a boxing in a, um, a sport that you got to play offense and defense, but you only credit him for the best defensive fighter of all so, time. So, and? I just respectfully disagree, and, and you know, I know that's You respectfully fair, disagree with what? That's what I'm trying to understand. What do you disagree you know, with? It, 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 it shouldn't be he's the best defensive fi- fighter. His record proves that Hey, whoever y'all put in front of him, he did it. And that should be Oh, the okay. So you're saying that I'm saying, by my saying he's the best defensive fighter ever, I'm not giving him enough credit for offense? That's that's exactly what I'm saying. Okay. I'm All right. Uh, that, 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 I'm like, you lost me. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. But, but okay, here's my thing. I can understand and respect where you're coming from because the reason why I won't disrespect your point, Dre, is that you have an appreciation for the art of boxing. So everything to you is not about the knockout. I totally respect that. But to me, it's almost like I I look at it from the perspective that his boxing skills are magnificent, both offense and defensively, clearly. But in terms of that knockout power, it's so flagrantly, uh, he's so flagrantly devoid of it moving up to the welterweight division, particularly over the last many years. You also got to understand, Dre, I'm coming from a place where I watched Roberto Duran in that division. 
I watch Aaron Pryor as a junior welterweight and Alexis Aguello and the Tommy Hitman Hearns and, and the Wilfredo Benitez who Sugar Ray Leonard beat and, of course, Sugar Ray Leonard and others. I come from watching that era. And I'm watching guys who were great boxers as well as great fighters and punchers. And when they lost to somebody, they lost to somebody that was great. They didn't, it wasn't like they lost to scrubs. Like, for example, Drake, marvelous Marvin Hagler knocked out Tommy the Hitman Hearns in three rounds. Greatest first round we ever saw, okay? Do you take anything away from Tommy Hearns for losing that fight? Absolutely not. You know why? And you know why? Because who was it against? It was against the great, marvelous Marvin Hack, but he came to fight. I, I, I get no, 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 I what, what I'm saying, you're going with look, look, All I'm saying to you is this. All I'm saying to you is this. I respect your position. Respect mine. I'm looking at it from the perspective that even when they lost, it was greatness that was there against them. And they had power and all of those things that came with it. Now, to a credit to Mayweather, he made guys look ordinary. And that is fair. But there has clearly been a drop off. Remember when Sugar Ray beat Hearns, it was the 14th round. Back then it was 15 round fights, man. You know, it was a different era. And I think that Mayweather, and then not only that, you didn't get to pick your opponents like they do now. And they had to wait for years and wait until guys were beyond their prime and stuff like that. No, 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 no. You had to fight them when the public demanded for the fights. All of those things play a role, Dre. I understand exactly what you're saying, but this man has, I mean, honestly, and it's sad because he's not like. Many, and it's well, he's, he's well, well you're so saying much. it's sad, Dre, but he is recognized as pretty much top five all time. It ain't like we're acting like Floyd Mayweather ain't in the conversation. No, it, it, it takes for him to, God forbid, anything happen to him. But, you know, we need to appreciate him while he's here, why he's done it, the way he's done it. Well, that's he fair. Took control over his, um, his destiny. Well, wait, 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 wait. we all give him credit for that. We all give him credit for that. Don't even bring up the money and the, and the promotion and everything else. We all give him credit for that. Nobody's denying it. But I got to run, Dre. Want to be a part of the show? Hit Stephen A. up weekdays from 1 to 3 Eastern at 866-729-3776. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it. Stephen A. Smith Show back here on ESPN Radio. No, I can't sing. Damn it. But I like doing that to just give people headaches. People are saying I can dance. Some people are saying I can't because I danced with the Jabberwockies on first take last week. Me and Teddy Atlas got into it Saturday night. It was a fun week in Vegas. I had a ball. I had a ball. Laughing it up, making a damn fool of myself. It was all in fun, though. All in fun. By the way, on a more serious note, Art Browse, former coach at Baylor, uh, remember he was fired uh, because of his handling of allegations of sexual assaults by students, student athletes. He was hired Monday as an assistant coach by the Hamilton Tiger Cats of the Canadian Football League. Former Hawaii and SMU coach June Jones, who was named the Tiger Cats' new head coach on Thursday, hired Browns as the team's assistant head coach for offense. Ladies and gentlemen, I have no problem with this. As negligent as his behavior was as head coach, football coach at Baylor, is he in prison? No. What do you want him to do? Be unemployed for the rest of his life? I wouldn't want him heading a college program. I wouldn't want my kids go or want my daughter going to a program he was the head of as his football coach. But that doesn't mean he doesn't deserve a job and an opportunity to make an honest living for his family. I have no problem with him getting a job. He just doesn't need to be a head coach on a collegiate level anymore. Back to the phones we go before we get on out of here. Let's make it quick. Marty and Callie, you're live with Stephen A. Go ahead. What's up, Stephen? Love you, man. Thanks, bro. How's the family? Everybody's all right. Go ahead. uh, Why why kneel down to the flag? Why not put your fist up and say, black power, right on. We will not submit. And we support. Stop right there. Stop right there. If you acknowledge it's a protest, why should a protest be something you like? Well, why what, you that well the flag. Well, the flag. What does the flag represent? Blood, peace, water, states. Stop right the there. Re- flag represents. Stop right there. You're not answering my question. I didn't ask you all of that. I said a protest is not designed to make you comfortable 
or to make it something that you like. So why try to define what a protest should be? Well, why not? What about results? Well, okay, that's fair. That's fair. That's totally fair. But why try to define a protest, what a protest should be? Because That's all I'm because saying. It's un- well, I'm not trying to define it. I'm saying okay. why not use what works best? I don't think that works best in this day and age, personally. To be honest with you. I really don't. I think people look at that and say, so what? But I got to go, Marty. Thank you. Let's go. What is it, to Markin? You're live with Stephen A.? Is that it, Markin? It's Markin, but that's Marquee. close enough. All right, um, go ahead, man. All right. So uh, two things real quick. Okay, Hurry first up. thing, I, I think uh, Connor was uh, pretty okay. And the thing I wanted to ask you was, uh, what if he decided to keep boxing? Like, who would you I want to see I think he'd get knocked out inside of four rounds by anybody <laughs> Against else. Against anyone? <laughs> Almost anyone. Go ahead. What's your next point? <laughs> that's it. That's all I want to know. All right, man. Thanks a lot. Jay in Long Island. You're live with Stephen A. Real quick, Jay. Go ahead. How's it going? Um, all right. Go ahead, man. I just – I just want to disagree. I agree with you as far as um, Jim Brown and the flag part, but I disagree when you say um, Kaepernick was very articulate in his the reason of why he was protesting. So anybody who so they keep trying to deflect things with this whole flag and national anthem. Can we stop covering it? Can you guys stop covering that? Because the anthem is not what the protest is about. The, and for the, Jim Brown, for, the for Jim Brown, no. bring, the answer is no. Call me back when I have more time to talk to you tomorrow. And also, don't ever tell us what to cover, because we're not going to listen. We're going to cover what we know the news to be, period. Get over it. Cam, you're live with Stephen A. Real quick, Cam, go ahead, buddy. Hey, Cam. Hey, this is Steve. Hey, Stephen A. This is Cam. Hey, I have a quick question. With Julian Edelman going out for the year, do you think the Madden curse has anything to do with it since it's like the second consecutive year, you know, with Rob going out the year before? Do I and think Julian what has Edelman to do with it? Do I think what has to do with it? The the Madden curse with the Patriots being on the cover. Do you Man, believe in the Madden curse? That's why you held on for over an hour to ask me about the Madden curse. What the hell's the that matter with it, y'all? Who cares? You mean the Madden curse? How the hell am I supposed to answer that question, Cam? How am I supposed to answer that question? What would I know about a Madden curse? What 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 do you know about a Madden curse? How would we possibly know the answer to that question? How? It's impossible. Nobody knows. Goodbye, man. I apologize to my listeners for ending the show with such a stupid question. I'll talk to y'all in 22 hours. Peace and love. That's just a sample of what you'll hear on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Channel 80 and the ESPN app.